A good morning, YouTube. Good afternoon. Good evening, depending on what part of the world you're in. I'm on the sunny Gold Coast where it is a morning and I'm having my morning coffee. You might know my cup by now. No bad days. It's always a good day when I get to talk to some cool, interesting guitar people. Speaking of which, I saw somebody lurking around my front door before. And before I answer that, I'm just going to give a quick little shout out <laughs> to Summer Cable, ET Guitars, and Chicken Picks for sponsoring the show. Uh, all those companies have been great uh, to me and very gracious in giveaways for you guys, which are coming up soon. So uh, there is a Chats with Guitar Cats podcast group on Facebook. Please add yourself there. That seems to get the most reach. Um, but as I said, I heard somebody lurking around outside and who's that out there? It is none other <laughs> than Mr. Troy Grady. Hey, Troy. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing, man? You caught me. You caught me. I caught you out there. Uh, I will delete the photos that I took through your uh, bedroom window. <laughs> <clears throat> you weren't expecting a little round of applause there in the doorbell? Yeah, no, I, that was. I, I feel like I'm on the Price is Right or something. Uh, I don't know if you have that down there. Do, do you have uh, the Price is Right? <laughs> back in the '80s, uh, that was a big you thing do. here as well. But it they was. used to call it <laughs> okay. the New Price is Right. Is what they called it here. Oh. Yeah. Was that the Drew Carey version? Is that what? No, no, no. This is a this is way back when I was a kid back in the eighties, but it was definitely here. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> Troy, I want to say thank you for helping me overcome um, my barriers in picking because I had no idea. I'd get to a certain speed on the guitar and I would just give up on picking because it would just end up in a jumbled mess. And I started becoming this real legato style hammer on player. And then I discovered your series, the cracking the code and it opened up a lot of doors. But for me, one of the funny things is, is you start off, you're talking about the sampling keyboard that you were using the Casio CZ one, the, the SK one, SK one. That's the one. Yeah. Mm hmm. How did you have one of those? Did you were you fascinated with synthesizers and things before you played guitar, or was that just something that just happened to come your way? And you, uh, well, I was I'm a piano player first, so cool. that that's that's my that was my first instrument, and in some sense, I'm probably still even more comfortable on keyboard than I am on a guitar. Really? Uh, because I spent yeah, probably spent a lot more time doing song stuff on that. Like if I'm going to be in a band playing through whole tunes, they'd be like Billy Joel songs or something. Because I'm from Long Island, which is a part of uh, the United States that you may not know about, but it is the, birth the birthplace of Billy Joel. And so if you're sort of familiar with Bruce Springsteen being from Jersey or John Bon Jovi being from Jersey, well, Billy Joel is, is the Long Island guy and he's basically a national religion. So if you can't play Angry Young Man, that's like, that's like the eruption of, of, you know, it's a Billy Joel eruption on keyboard. If you can't play that, you're not cool in Long Island. And uh, any night of the week, you, you hit up any Long Island bar where they've got a guy on keyboards and he will play through the entirety of The Stranger, like scenes from an Italian restaurant, the whole thing. And uh, the, the songs are just that well known. So I've been playing, you know, keyboards or p piano specifically since, um, I don't know, at some point, sub 10 years old. I, I don't know how old I was. So, uh, but that year when the Casio SK-1 came out, it was heavily marketed during the holiday season. And they showed this guy sampling a dog, you know, into the sampler. And then playing the dog back at various pitches, and everyone, you know, anyone who even even people who weren't musicians instantly wanted this thing, and it only cost like sixty five or seventy dollars, which even then was cheap for that kind of thing. Um, and so that was the big Christmas gift that year, and I got one, and a couple of my friends got one, and it was like instant Beastie Boys from that point on. Very cool, man. I I um, yeah. was fascinated with those particular keyboards. Uh, our Kmart over here used to have a, a little section with musical instruments and i can rem remember being a kid and that particular keyboard you know sampling my voice in there and being absolutely mm -hmm. blown away at being able to press buttons and you know, bark like a dog and play melodies because i, I must admit <laughs> before i wanted to be eddie van halen i wanted to be bruno from fame do you remember the show fame i do but i don't i don't remember i don't think i watched it but okay I, bruno was, was the, the keyboard player on there who was pretty much the okay. one-man band kind of guy yeah and I was just like, yeah, I want to do that. And then I heard eruption. <laughs> and yeah, it right. came over. So yeah. How did you transition from right, piano to guitar? Uh, I think it was it was puberty mainly. 
you know, because <laughs> guitar was cool, right? I mean, it yeah. was the 80s, so, you know, people wanted to, or, you know, as a guy, you, you're looking for something that will get the chicks, kind of. And my, we had this uh, catalog that was a, um, it was my dad was in the, in the Army, and so we get the Navy Exchange ca catalog, or what we call the PX catalog. And it's just, it's like a Sears Roebuck or kind of Macy's, I don't know, it's like a Sears catalog, you know, and they've got everything from clothes to electronics in there. And I kept going back to, I just kept flipping through it to this one page where they had what I now know to be an Explorer style guitar, but it had a giant spider web on it and like four pickups or something. <laughs> it, was three, it was at least three pickups. More, and more I just better. kept looking at that. More <laughs> is definitely better. It was like that Randy Rhodes, you know, the guitar where he's got, there's like no space to pick in between the, key, in between the pickups. And I, and I saw this and I just, I didn't have any particular agenda to play guitar. I don't know where this came from. But I kept looking at that guitar, and it's just like, you know, you, gas, right? We know what gas is as adults, you know? Well, I guess I had it as a teenager. And it, it, it's like, you know, you wanted the Atari game or the Activision game or whatever, and in this thing, I just kept looking at this guitar, or, or the RC car, you know? And I kept looking at this guitar, and I was just like, that, I, you know, the wheels were turning. I don't know why I needed that. So uh, we went to Sam Ash, which was a big local, it's like a regional chain music store. It's like a, before there were guitar centers, there were Sam Ash. And we went there and they had that poster on the wall of Eddie Van Halen holding the, the Kramer Pacer. And I was just like, like that's what I wanted. And I knew I wasn't going to get it because it was, it was, you know, it was like 500 bucks or something at the time, which was like a million basically, or it was like $800, which was like a million. And it said, so instead I got an Ibanez Roadstar 2 or Roadster 2, Roadstar, I don't know how you pronounce it, but it was, it was a decent, I guess, sort of $250 guitar at the time. I still have it. And that was, that's what I went home with, you know, and it was like a humbucker, two single coils and a tremolo. And it was, yeah, it was good. I mean, what, I didn't know the difference, you know, it, I just knew it wasn't a Kramer. So, and I did not know what a Les Paul was or a Stratocaster. I never heard of those things. I did not know that it was basically a Strat copy. I had no concept of any of these things. If it wasn't pink and pointy, you know, like the pointy headstock and hot pink or had like a cool splatter design on it. It was I, all the rage. Pointy of the better. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and, and I didn't, you know, as even as adults, like there's so much baggage with guitar and guitar equipment, like the history of it. Some, if, especially some forums are very gear, you know, uh, sort of oriented. And it's like, if you don't know what a PAF is, it's like, get out of here. You know, who are you? Right. You know, yeah. uh, and, and it took a long time to know enough about guitars and how they're made to not feel like a total outsider. And even still sometimes, like I'll, I'll read discussions and just feel like, like I don't even really know what they're talking about, right? I just feel like I'm the new guy in the room, even at you know pushing fifty. <laughs> so, uh, so I had this thing, you know. I didn't really know. I had no concept of the history of it. I just knew it wasn't the Spiderweb guitar, and it wasn't the Kramer Pacer, so uh, or the Beretta, whatever, whatever it was in the ad. Yep. It's the one where he's got the clown shirt, and it says no bozos, and he's holding the guitar. He's holding like a white guitar. Yep. And he looks amazing. He, you know, you want to be him. You see that ad, and you're just like, I want to be that guy. And I want that guitar, even though his guitars weren't, you know, he made them out of parts. You know, yep. his, I mean, some of them were Kramer's or Kramer at Kramer parts, but you know, the, the famous ones was just a bunch of spare parts from, yeah, you yeah. know, the shops in California. Uh, but so that's how guitar started. It was, it was, I don't know. It was just sort of this, um, you know, this process of, of like really wanting a thing, just like you wanted a video game or a hacky sack. Yeah. And it just morphed into that. And I definitely had no agenda of doing, I had no idea I'd be doing what I'm doing now. Cool. And did you seek out a teacher early on? Were you, were you self-taught? How did that all work? Um, no, no, I did. I, I had, of course, taken piano lessons. So I'm like, all right, I, I get music. You know, like I know some basic things, but I, I don't know. I don't even remember what conscious thought process I had about teaching, but I know that the first thing I did was I ordered probably like many people, a metal method cassette called the metal primer from Doug Marks, who is a great guy. And I've actually know Doug now, which is, is quite a trip to, to know some of these people that you grew up, uh, you know, and, and I can, I can really say that Doug Marks was the first, actually I'd say the second, uh, any kind of guitar teaching I had, there was a point a couple years earlier in school where we were given a bunch of, uh, probably student sized acoustic guitars and they taught us, you know, something like that, like a bunch of chords in sequence with some type of song. And I knew, I remembered D, because I remember everyone had trouble doing D. And then we did G7 or G, and then we did, maybe it was G7, I don't remember. But we, so there was like a few chords I had learned in, just in a music school, in class in maybe third or fourth grade in elementary school. And then uh, years later, I got, you know, the real metal guitar and, and ordered up a Doug Marks cassette, which, 
I reordered many years later when we were doing Cracking the Code. Doug was actually, he had reissued a lot of those old cassettes that he used to sell in the back of magazines in the 80s. And we got a CD, got one on CD and it had scans of the original printouts, which I believe his wife drew at the time. All those drawings of like fretting and bar chords and stuff were these cool like comic style drawings. And I believe it was his wife or girlfriend at the time that drew them. Oh, cool. And, uh, and the, the actual lessons were there. It was really, again, quite, quite a trip. So uh, Metal Primer, I don't think I got any other Metal Method cassettes. I don't really know what happened at that point. I think it, it just began the long road of, you know, records and stealing licks and all that. And of course, the SK-1 helped with that. Yeah, yeah. So I, I remember seeing the uh, the Metal Method, Doug Marks things in the uh, in the magazines, Guitar Player, Guitar World. Uh, but being over this side of the world, I, I never actually got my hands on one of those to see mm-hmm. what kind of content was in it. Was that f- mostly focused on lead guitar playing, I, I take it, yeah? It was, yeah, and it was it was all kind of first person. Like the each of these lessons were packaged as uh, a particular subject. The metal primer was like the top, you know, ten things you need to know to get your guitar going. Like a pick, how to hold it, whether you should pick from the elbow or the wrist, that kind of thing. Um, how to do a bar chord, I remember was in there, important stuff. And then there were some uh, sort of finger exercise kind of things, basic like uh, you know repetitive patterns that you could work on. And then he had a bunch of others. I don't remember exactly which subjects were, but I know I remember towards the at the sort of the advanced end, he had like an Eddie Van Halen one where he taught you a bunch of Eddie Van Halen licks, and there were some Randy Rhodes licks. But throughout this series, one of the things that was really interesting was there was a certain amount of first person commentary in the written part of the lessons, which talked about him as a guy from the Midwest of the United States moving to Los Angeles during this time when you know everyone was moving west and playing in bands and playing shows. And it was all super foreign. Like, I didn't know what he was talking about. He was, he had a whole section on how you shouldn't buy your own PA. <laughs> was like, oh, right. Okay. I, I didn't, I was like, well, I didn't know what a PA is. I had a physician's assistant. What is it? I don't know, but you shouldn't buy one. Don't buy a PA because all the good clubs have the PA there apparently. Well, of course. Yeah. Obviously you're not going to go buy the sound system, but I guess if you're from the Midwest, you think, well, you get hired to play the backyard party you got to come with your own your whole setup you know you're, you're like a dj right yeah so don't don't blow all your money on a PA. <laughs> but it more so than that w- what it was was just a, sort of a slice of life that you as a kid growing up in the suburbs we're, we're like holy cow these dudes are live they're out there and they're like living this life and they're wearing the spandex and they're playing the shows and they live in crappy apartments and eat ramen front you know <laughs> like instant ramen noodles. And they, one guy accidentally almost lost all of his money. He bought the wrong, he bought the sound system he shouldn't have bought. And it's just, you're reading this and you're learning like about the culture, you know, as yeah. much as you're learning about the guitar yeah. stuff. That's so that great. Was pretty that's cool. And really, that, was his, that was his story. That's really personally. outside thinking of what to include into a guitar instruction uh, book, isn't it? Like uh, priceless stuff that you'd have to live that lifestyle to, to learn those things. I guess I don't even know. It just came across like a guy read, you know, reading a guy's diary or something like that. And I, I was like, oh, I, I suppose the implication was that if you're doing this stuff, it's probably because you want to be in a band. Yeah. But I never was actually. And and being sort of like a nerd and an introvert, I, like the bedroom was the band. You know, like that that was where I was most comfortable. That's where the Atari was, and that's where the sampling keyboard was, and the stereo, and all the other cool stuff that we screwed around with. And the band, such as it was, was a bunch of kids in a bedroom sampling sounds off the radio and creating beats on these primitive drum machines and recording these weird beastie boys like mashups that had electronic sounds and guitar sounds in them. So like completely not anything to do with that whole rock scene. And in fact, none of my friends were even in that world. I did not have long haired spandexy friends. I didn't have that look. I was on sports teams and looked like a jock. Kind yeah, of. Right. I was okay. somewhere in the honors classes with a jock. So you know, it was the times were changing. Of course, I graduated in 1990. I don't know when you you same finished year. up high school. Yep, same, same year. year. So it's like by 90, I mean everything was flannel, and like I remember Battle of the Bands. Somebody played um, "Sympathy for the Devil," which never would have happened four years before. It would have been all Poison and Guns and Roses. Yep. So, or you know, two three years before, it would have been all Poison and Guns and Roses. And now you had these grungy dudes. Another guy was like a heavy heavy into um, another like one of the other like really good guitar players in my school was a major stoner. And would actually play like high times weed festivals later on, like right after we graduated, yep. he became like a figure in that world. So it, it was very different, you know. Like the the winds shifted almost immediately by the time 1990 rolled around, and before you know it, it was like Jane's Addiction and Rage Against the Machine and all that stuff was there, yeah. and you didn't even know where it came from because no one, I mean, that stuff just wasn't 
You know, I mean, the Stones was as grungy and then Zeppelin and all that was as grungy as we got where I was from. And then you go to college and boom, it's like a light switch went off, you know. It was a real shift, wasn't it? In um, yeah. just guitar as being a, a, a an instrument at the front. You had that that time in the 80s where if you had a, a gun guitar player in your band, your band would be famous. It, it was very <laughs> Maybe, much about yeah. that. And then it in was, the I 90s, mean, I- it was very anti, you know, like um, – there was a few few guitar heroes out there, Jerry Cantrell, uh, Mike McCready. I quite liked Mike McCready's playing as well, but mm-hmm. that wasn't yeah. the level and, uh, of flash that was around in the 80s by any means. No, but but at the same time, there were definitely solos, right? Like live, mm. at the end of live, you know, that th- or alive, the Pearl Jam yep. tune. There was definitely solo happening there. And um, Tom Morello, of course, like yep. doing all that crazy stuff with the pitch shifting pedal. Um, and, and that was kind of like an extension of the Beastie Boys, electronic drums and guitar, kind of with the guy from Slayer that played on the Beastie Boys song. Um, it was a Carrie King, I think was, he uh, played on, um, No Sleep Till Brooklyn, which is, was like a metal Beastie Boys song basically. Yeah. And, uh, and so it was, there was a through line there, you know, and, and by the same token, if you go back to the eighties, I would say that's not really the killer guitar player that made the band. It was the hit, right? Like you needed the big chorus. Like even before Extreme had Nuno, they had Mother Don't Want to Go to School Today. And I've seen the old, there's an older version of that song recorded either, I think, without him or something. And there's an old video. And clearly someone heard that and is like, okay, that's that's the money right there. That's yeah, the right. song that we're going to make a lot of money on. So I, I think like a lot of those bands to me are just, we thought of them as metal at the time, but I just think of them as pop bands now. Like they were all about big choruses and big drums. You know, guitars mixed a little bit back, weirdly enough. Always a solo, of course. But if you didn't have a hook, you had nothing. You know, yeah. a riff. You needed a riff and a hook. You didn't, the solo was kind of like incidental, yep. I think, to a lot of that. I mean, Pyromania would be just as good, not well, not as good, but Pyromania would still be an incredible al- classic album that we all remember because of those massive harmonies and massive hooks that Absolutely. were on the album. Same thing with Out of the Cellar. So you, you but, weren't yeah. playing in bands in the early days? Mm-mm. No, I was just, uh, I was going to track practice, trying to run a mile under five minutes. Yeah. And... Uh, and then trying to get into college or something like I, it was all vague, <laughs> like, you know, co- why well, go to college? I don't know, because I don't want to be unemployed. And I come from a very blue collar sort of family. And it was just like, well, you got to do something. College was a trade school. That's it. I mean, the idea that you were going to get a liberal arts education was not at the forefront of it. I mean, I didn't even know what the phrase meant. So um, there was this kind of very existential worry about what, what am I going to be doing? And I definitely was not thinking music at all. Because, I mean, where's the playbook for that, right? Like, you don't, can't major in rock star. As much as in the back of your mind, you're like, oh, well, like, that, that would be really cool. But, like, no one's plucking you out of obscurity to go tour with Van Halen or something. Yeah. So I don't even think I realistically considered doing anything with music. And I definitely, like, even going to music school was not anywhere on the radar. I, I didn't really even know what Berkeley was. Like, I knew, I had heard of it, sort of. I knew it had something to do with guitar or music. I didn't know what kind of degree you would get from there, and I didn't know what you would do with that degree, uh, which is, is funny now, obviously, because it's, it's such an epicenter of the kind of stuff that we do, and so many of the people that we've worked with went there. So I use them as an example. And, of course, the West Coast uh, version of that was um, Musicians Institute, right, GIT, Guitar Institute of Technology, which was like the big thing in the 80s. So I'd heard these names, but I didn't really know what they were about or why people went there. And there was never any danger that I was going to go to these places because, again, what did, you know, can you work in an office with that kind of, you know, <laughs> with that kind of degree? What do you, what kind of money they make? You know, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it was just, it wasn't, I wasn't playing in bands. I was just like doing school and trying to get a driver's license and trying to figure out where you fit in the world and deciding how long or short my hair should be and all the normal kid stuff. <laughs> all the hard questions in life, huh? <laughs> the hard questions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. So there is a short list of things that I would go back and tell myself, you know, the younger me, you know, if you run into the younger you and like a good two or three of those relate to hair. So, you know, it's like, okay, like ditch the round brush, pal. It's just not worth it. You know, <laughs> like go, just, just go to something you can come over and just like get out, get out of the shower. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, the hard questions. Well, man, for watching your series, um, you're one hell of a player and most people develop those kinds of chops playing in bands in their teenage years and you know, that dedication of playing the song from beginning to end. Um, you must have spent a lot of time in the bedroom playing then if you weren't playing in bands. Uh, I guess, but like you're, there was at least half the time divided with piano stuff because yeah. 
In fact, the, the piano is probably the instrument where I have more obvious memories of doing things that we think of as practice. Yeah. Where, because there's a large repertoire there. If you're going to try and learn a million Billy Joel songs or other things, some of them are really quite involved. And that instrument, because the mechanics are easier, it's one of those things where if you do put a lot of time in it, you realize you actually can learn these pieces. Like a lot of it really is a more of a memorization challenge. Like, okay, what finger goes where and at what time? And the more you kind of repeat that and traditional music practice advice where it's like, okay, get all the notes, go a little bit faster, that kind of thing. It works there because the technique isn't so opaque. There's not as many ways to do piano technique wrong. There are some, and there are definitely, you know, when it comes to certain very fast things, there are players that use inefficient motions, but I think it's harder to really shoot yourself in the foot on a keyboard, especially if your goal is like, I just need to play the keyboard part in the Bon Jovi tune, or I need to play even, even hard stuff like Billy Joel type of things like root beer rag or again, angry young man, that stuff responds to, to training. So there's, I spent a lot more time on keyboards just memorizing these songs, these long songs, especially where you had you know, left and right hands coordinating together, doing different things at a particular time. With guitar, because um, it wasn't obvious what to do, and that the very few steps that I took didn't really seem to work, like the, the traditional music practice advice applied to developing like the Yngwie style picking technique never really worked. Like I could, I had some sense that I could move quickly, but everything was always sloppy, just like what you were saying earlier, where every time you speed up, it's just kind of a jumble of notes. And on top of that, there was this feeling of like getting stuck or something, because there, mm. there was something about going across the strings that where you know, I was getting stuck and I didn't know what was causing that. So I think that completely derailed the whole practice thing. So I spent a lot of time in the room, right? But like, I don't know what I did in that. You know, there was probably albums spread out or, you know, across the bed and like the keyboard would be there. And if some friends were over, we might be like recording a song, like a, like a Weird Al parody type tune of some pop song. We're just playing around with drum beats and recording guitar riffs over them, things like that. So there was a lot of that. And there were a few things that I learned note for note. Like I remember learning Hot for Teacher, the solo there, because it was one of those things that you could do. It wasn't, you know, it was more of a, of, um, a picking and pull-offs kind of a thing. And it wasn't so much, you know, and there were other Eddie things that were legit, straight up fast picking that were hard. Uh, like I'm the one had moments of that in Spanish Fly, of course. But there were things that, you know, where you could actually take a stab at doing it, playing the jump solo, the beat it solo. So those things, you know, I, I did spend time learning those things and, and it kind of worked. But of course, the, the challenge there was knowing where all the licks were and how they work. Like still to this day, people argue over where the open strings and the pull-offs are in the sure. option, that kind of thing. Sure. You know? Now, um, but I, I, yeah, there wasn't as much of the practice -y thing in the traditional sense. Yep, yep. So um, theory-wise, did you learn your theory as it relates to the piano, I guess, where it's a lot easier to, to see the notes? Is that where theory um, sort of came together for you? Chords and chord progressions. Yep. Like ripping songs off the radio, chords and chord progressions. That's yep. where it all was. Um, like, you know, why, why, is this song, why does this song appear to be in the key of C, but why is there a B flat in there? Right, like, well, why does it? Why does the song start and end on the C, the C chord, and why does it sort of seem to focus on that? But why is there a B flat major chord in there? Why is there an F chord in there? That looks like an F major key signature, but this song is clearly in C. So I don't know. Then I'm just calling that the C, the C song with the B flat key signature. And it wasn't until years later that I learned that that was Mixolydian. And yep. I didn't know that that was. But they're Richard Marx songs, you know, big popular piano guy and or keyboards guy in the yep. mid '80s. Yep. Don't mean nothing was a, a hit that he had. And that was that was a C mixolydian kind of song, C B flat F, C B flat F, and uh, and of course at the same time the guitar magazines were incessantly they were hitting you over the head with all the stuff about modes, yep. but the way they described them was so non intuitive I had no idea that they were talking about the thing that I was already doing on piano. Yeah, you know they would show you like eight notes in a row and say from C if you start on C and go to C, you know that's uh, Ionian, and then if you start on D and go to D that's Dorian. And I'm like, but it's the same notes. There's yeah. no difference. Like, I don't get it. How is that anything different? I'm like, it doesn't sound any different. But of course, at the same time, I was playing starting on C and going to C, but throwing in a B flat, which of course would be like starting on G and going to G in the key of C and playing it all on white keys. Same thing, Mixolydian. It wasn't about that. It was about you know the tonal center being the C chord and the chord progression kind of focusing on that. But no one explained this, or at least not to my mind, no one explained it properly in a way that I understood. And, and I'm kind of... I would have jumped so far ahead had I known this. But thankfully, you know, it was, again, to answer your question, ripping, ripping chord progressions uh, off the radio um, and just sort of stockpiling a mental database of how many of these, you know, there were and what all the cool 
uh, you know, the, the kind of trick chord progressions were like the Layla chord progression, right? Where you're in, you're in some sort of major tonic, right? And then you go to the flat seven, nine chord. You do a nine chord, that's the flat seven, right? So if you're in C, you go to B flat seven and go back to C or something like that. And, uh, or I think Layla might be in D, I don't remember, but there's, um, the, you do a D major chord, and you go to a C nine and back to D major. That's like a way, it's like a dominant substitution. It's a way to get you back to the one chord. And that I learned from Layla that that works. Right, that that's a thing that you can do. If you're writing a tune in a major key, you can throw in that flat seven. And Billy Joel also does it in New York State of Mind, right? Which is in C. And he does a B flat nine, he goes back to C. Cool, yeah. cool. So this kind of thing, just over and over again. Man, that really resonates with me because I was in exactly the same boat when it came to modes. And mm -hmm. um, I would get that exact same uh, description. Yeah, you play a C to a C, that's Ionian, D to D, Dorian. Yeah. And I can remember we had so many music teachers come and go in my high school. And we had a guy start up when I was in year 12 who played a bit of guitar. And I said to him before one of our first classes, do you know about modes? And he's like, yeah. And I said, <laughs> great, because I, I want to learn about that. I can remember he got up in front of the class and he did that exact description that we, we just talked about, C to C as I only yeah. in D to D. And I remember putting my hand up and saying, sir, how do we use that when making music? And he kicked yeah. me out of the classroom and said, get out, you <laughs> smart ass. I was being serious. He thought you were being difficult. He thought I was being difficult. It was just like, man, that's yeah. the that's the ex explanation that I keep getting. And it makes absolutely no sense to me. How do I use this? And I was very lucky right. that uh, around about the same time, somebody took me to a Frank Gambale clinic. Mm. And Frank focused... Well, firstly, that was the first time I ever saw anybody sweet pick. <laughs> but secondly, he focused on the modes. Uh, and I can remember him playing a chord progression that went A, G, D, A. And he said, okay, what key is that in? Everyone went A. And then he went, okay, how about this one? G, D, A, G. What key is that in? G. And, yeah, and, and so, so on. And then he said, well, right. but they're all the same chords. How, how does that work? And he explained that mm. the, 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 tunnel big, center. the big penny drop moment was he said, anytime you see two major chords a tone apart, that's your four and your five of the parent key. And right. that was the moment where I just went, oh, this guy's not throwing right. just numbers at me. He's right. That's how I can use this. And that was my, my stepping stone into understanding the modes. Gotcha. Then he had, uh, okay, any questions at towards the end? And <laughs> everybody put their hand up and he went, any questions not to do with the way I was just picking then? And everyone pulled their hands down <laughs> and he was like, okay, let's talk about my picking. That's weird. That's so, funny. Yeah, that's got, that probably would have blown minds. I mean, that was what, like late 80s or was it 90s? It was late 80s, it, no later than 1990. Yeah. And that would have, I, I didn't know. Here's another funny thing. I, I'd heard the word sweeping and I think we put this in the Cracking the Code series, but I didn't know what it meant. I, I thought sweeping was, you know, like a, like a, some kind. Yep. But I didn't know like that you could, you know, en enunciate individual notes inside of that and actually get you know, like play an arpeggio like at an even tempo in the middle of scalar notes and other things. I, I didn't realize. And for some reason, I did not ever listen to Jason Becker. Like, I, and, and I did not know Ingve was doing sweeping because there was no video of it. You couldn't see it. I mean, you, there was videos on MTV, but there wasn't, you know, and Ingve is, is remarkably, you know, let's call it intuitive <laughs> about his own technique. He, on the REH video that I eventually got, you know, he doesn't, he just says, I don't think about it. I just kind of yep. sweep and alternate. I think it's true. I don't, I don't begrudge him that at all. The best players don't think about that kind of thing, but there wasn't, you could get through the eighties, not knowing what a sweep was, especially if you had no guitar player friends, if your friends were all keyboard players or just, just people having the Frank and Bali thing to be able to walk down the block and see him at whatever music store, or wherever you saw that. So that, that would blow my mind seeing Frank at, you know, when I was 17 or something. It was a, a very um, eye-opening experience. Like I said, it was just that penny drop moment on on modes and sweet picking. First time to see somebody sweet pick up, mm. up close. So, speaking of sweeping, sweet picking, picking techniques. Uh, watching your series, I see that you. Uh, it was all about the sampling keyboard that helped you to slow things down at first to, to hear things. Fast forward to now. There's so many cool technologies right. around. Is mm -hmm. there a particular program that, that you use when you're trying to work out 
things today as opposed to using the, the sample um, keyboard? No, I mean, other than Final Cut, I mean, because everything's just video now, right? So, yep. and Final Cut, if any, if you haven't used it, has, uh, I, to my mind, the simplest, the easiest to use speed ramping kind of uh, capabilities. It, it may not have more capabilities, but they're the they're the easy they're the most easily exposed because you can just grab any clip in the timeline and just stretch it, just yep. like literally yank it. You can cut it here, cut it here, and just pull it, and it just gets slower to any amount that you want. And of course, this is important for the interviews that we do where we're filming in higher frame rates. So there is more detail there. You slow it down, you will actually see these movements, you know, in, in greater detail. So you can, even if you're grabbing something like a YouTube, uh, like a clip off of YouTube, you can use the built-in um, slowdown capability of YouTube, which is useful, actually. The problem there mainly is that it's usually out of sync. And I don't know why this is, but very often clips on YouTube are a couple of frames off, which is sure. enough to be one pick stroke off. Yeah. So like if you think that downstroke played that note, it might actually play the previous note. So what I end up having to do is drop something into Final Cut, separate the audio and the video, and then slide them a little bit until it lines up. And then you can rewrap them up. And from there, you can then apply any kind of slow. You can stretch that. That becomes a new clip, which is an incredible, incredible uh, capability, which is um, the technical term within Final Cut is compounding. So you can take any two clips, wrap them up in a new clip, and then you can do whatever you want. That Slow that down. That's how we do, um, when we do interviews, we have the split screen angle where you see the picking hand and the wide thing. We just put the picking hand over here, right on top of the other video, compound it up, and now it's basically one clip. And you yep. can slow that down as, as we do in our features and so forth. So Final Cut, honestly, I just live in a lot of this video editing stuff. Is uh, I find it actually really easy to use. Don't be uh, scared of it because it's a pro level application. Just getting setting up a project is like five clicks, simplest thing. Yep. Yeah, I'm a Final Cut user myself. And um, I guess Apple very wise with iMovie being... Uh, the, the stepping stone yeah. towards it. If you can get your head around iMovie, that's going to make a, a great progress towards uh, upscaling to Final Cut. I, I use mm -hmm. a particular program called Transcribe, which right. uh, allows me to drop videos in and slow down the speed, knock it the, the timing around by a frame or two if it needs to be. Mm -hmm. But one really cool feature with that is being able to loop things and every time it loops, tell it, to increase by X amount um, for so many repetitions. And that's how I've been trying to get my licks, seemingly impossible licks down, is by looping mm -hmm. them in this, in this program called Transcribe. I see. Yeah, yeah. So the, meaning, the loop feature speeds up over time. You're it saying. does, yeah. It took me a little while I to see. find that, but I'm, I'm very glad uh -huh. I did because it's a very gotcha. cool feature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I Troy, know a lot with, of people use that. With the, with the Sorry, series, mate, um, do you do all the animations and stuff yourself? Have you got a team working on that? Because that's a lot of work, man. That's a lot of work. Well, we, yeah, we have a small company. We're a small business here. We're a team okay. of two people now. We were three. Uh, one of the guys that was with me for like 10 years um, recently uh, joined another startup, which is, you know, so I think we got into this partly because of the music thing, but the guys that work with me weren't even necessarily musicians. They're just more like music fans. And so we jokingly call the uh, we jokingly call both of them the, the most technical non guitarists on the planet, because uh, th it's just the conversations we have, you know, about the things that we have to animate and um, and the, the the scripts that we have to write are just so in depth that even though they're not really players, not they both play, but they're not um, they're not uh, technical lead players like the way that our audience is. But these, these guys know the concepts as well as, as any of the people that follow our stuff, obviously. So, you know, picking motions and who does what, I mean, it's really kind of hilarious, actually. So there is a Discovery Channel mindset that you can have to do this stuff that, doesn't, that isn't necessarily even a musical one. Like, what, whatever the notes are is one thing, but like the actual physical motions that are creating the notes and how the pick goes from one string to another, all these things that we have at one point or another drawn or animated, uh, have, which have been done by all of us, to answer your question. We, we've all done those things. So I, I've done their whole scenes that you've watched that I've animated, their whole scenes they've watched that Adam has animated, and their whole scenes that you've watched that Brendan has animated. So it's it's a group effort. Depends on who who's available at the time. Wow! And is that and, something you, and we you use studied? Motion for that? Did you study animation no. or anything like that? You just picked it up and no, it was just um, it was just a thing that we learned using uh, a program which I really quite like. It's called Motion, and it's part of Apple's video application suite. Yeah, the big dog in that space is um, Adobe After Effects, but a little ugly looking. On like some of the things that you can do in motion really elegantly, 
Motion has more of a layers palette, kind of like uh, Photoshop, where you can nest things in folders. So it becomes a little bit more like programming, similar to the compound feature of Final Cut, where you can take things and put them in a thing. Well, in, in Motion, you can do the same thing. So if you're drawing Eddie Van Halen, well, you can draw all the parts separately. You can draw you know, the hair, the, uh, you can draw the eyes and the nose and put them in a folder and call it face. And then you can draw the hair and the head, put it in another folder, call it head. And now all that stuff, if I change the coordinates of it, they all move. And then you can, of course, also animate all these parts separately. So they, the hair can blow and the wind and the arms can move. But the coordinates are all sort of nested inside one another. And then effects that you apply also have this sort of nested feature. So if you've ever done any software development, it's kind of like a little bit like functions inside of functions or maybe a little bit like object-oriented programming, kind of. So Motion is, I, I think, a super elegant program. And anybody wants to get involved in doing um, it's a kind of simple 2, 2D drawing things that we do and sliding things around for your YouTube videos. It's cool. Uh, it's not that crazy to learn it. And it's just basically a drawing program where you move things around. Cool. I'm going to have to learn that. I, mm -hmm. I do believe I have it. Um, I, I used yeah. to be a, a creative working for, for Apple, teaching people Final Cut and, and the like, and my, my oh, flatmate oh, still okay. does. So I'm going to have to get yeah. up to him and say, man, do you know motion? Teach it to me. Because that sounds like oh, something yeah. I could really utilize. Did you know it before you started doing the series or did you no. have the idea for the series and then you're like, well, I need to animate this. Let's learn this, this program motion. Yeah, it was just what was there at the time. And this was, you're going back like over 10 years, right? So in 2010 or 2011, when you bought, you know, Final Cut used to come in a box, right? Like I remember we, you know, you went, I went to the Apple store and I bought Final Cut and Logic. They both came in these enormous boxes with manuals and stuff. And like there was a moment, I remember I had to cut a piece of wood with the guy downstairs and we went out front and we needed something to put the wood on. And I was like, hold on. And I went and I got the final cut in the logic box and I put them and they were like a sawhorse. And I was like, this is the most hipster thing to ever happen in Brooklyn right now. It's like two dudes cutting, you know, power, cutting wood on, on a giant logic and final cut boxes. But motion came in that suite. They used to call it, I forget what it was, like the video professional suite or something like that. And Motion was just the program that you got for free. So there it was. And so I just learned it because it was there. And it was much simpler and way more buggy at the time. Motion now is awesome. I mean, you can do all kinds of things. The one thing that it really doesn't and it doesn't do and isn't, it's not a 3D program in the sense of, you know, everything now has got to be 3D. If you ever play a video game, everything's got to have texture mapping and reflections. And Motion doesn't really do that. Motion is more of an animation, like a two, what, what I call 2.5D. It's flat things that you can fly around or through, like a whole world made out of playing cards, kind of. Okay. So if you ever noticed a lot of the animations in our things, it's like Eddie Van Halen looks like a cartoon, a flat cartoon character. So he's not 3D when you, you know, you fly around him. Yep. But you can stack shapes and stuff just like you can with playing cards, you know. Yep. So you can make boxes and square shapes, and we've done a lot of, we've completely stretched it to its limit, making things that look like cars or buildings that you can actually go around in, in three, three dimensions. Yep. But it's not, uh, it's not difficult to learn. And uh, I think it's a lot less daunting than After Effects. But at the same time, if you're doing this for, for a living, if you want to become marketable, After Effects is what everyone uses. And you'd probably be crazy not to learn it. But if you just okay. want to do something fun, I, I highly recommend it. I'm going to have a look at Motion. I'm pretty sure I've, I've got it on my computer somewhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Troy, how long did it take between you coming up with the concept of wanting to do the, the Cracking the Code series before you actually started to upload it? Was that a very big, long, drawn-out process of learning how to do yeah. it? Or? Yeah, totally. I mean, well, you say series. Like, we haven't done any of that stuff in years. Like, the, the series thing, I know, like, I'm, I, it warms my heart that you watched it. But we haven't made those, those video episodes we made five, six years ago or, or more, you know? So uh, we didn't know what business there was. I just knew that I was in another line of work. I was a headhunter in New York. We, I worked in the tech industry. So I recruited software engineers and mathematicians, people working in software companies or a lot of uh, finance industry businesses like hedge funds where they do a lot of fancy math and a lot of programming. And so I did that stuff and I made enough money to buy, to like put down payment on a house and um, to stash enough away. And after a while, I was just like, there, there's only so many times I can go through this process of getting people a job in a company and it just becomes very repetitive. And I was like, I, I maybe I should do something else and I didn't know what it should be. At the same time, I'd been sitting on all this guitar stuff, and I knew that there was the potential for the knowledge to be impactful for people, to potentially change lives, right? I mean, literally, I just thought, if this can change someone's life, then there's got to be a living in it somehow. And it doesn't need to be a million dollars a year. I just need to be able to like pay the mortgage you know, and keep going. So I just literally quit with nothing else. You know? And I just sat at home for a year eating a food cart, you know, like the halal stuff, and sitting at the table learning motion. 
and writing scripts and just started like writing the first versions of a lot of these animated things that you ended up watching. And I didn't, I had no idea if this was like how we would make money. I, this was like right around the time when like user driven anything was starting to take off as, as a paying business. Like, you know, paying five bucks for a comedy show, like Louis CK did a comedy show at the Beacon Theater or something, and you could download it for $5. And that was like the first time I'd, I heard anybody sell anything that you could easily pirate. You know, why would someone buy something that you could pirate? Well, they would because they want to watch it now and five bucks is cheap. That's why. Yeah. And it's yeah. good, right? You know, he had, it was like a pro level production. So we started writing these stories, this like whole story. And we figured, I don't know, maybe we'll sell it, the story. Or then that, that morphed into, well, like literally over a process of years, it morphed into, well, maybe we'll sell lessons. So it will like, teach you like how to play the stuff in the stories. And then it gradually became apparent after, after doing that, that there was a lot of uncertainty in this world of how to learn picking technique. And that really our business should be an instructional business where we actually teach you how to do these things and you sign up for lessons. And, and it wasn't even obvious that that should be a subscription site where you know this kind of all encompassing little sandbox that we have now where you sign up and you watch all the interviews. But it, it sort of revealed itself over, over time. Of course, had we known, we would have started out doing this right away. We would have cut the series probably in half, you know, yeah, made right. half as yeah. many episodes and then you know, and started building out the instructional platform. There wasn't really an easy way to do that back then. Now, you, you know, everybody can launch a paywall type website now using a million different ways where you can be on Patreon and do that, or there's a hundred other ways you can do it. But this, none of this was obvious at the time. The real pioneers in this world were people like Justin Guitar and um, Scott from Scott's Bass Lesson, Scott Devine, yep. really, really great guy. Um, I've talked to him, super nice dude. He was very helpful. Um, of with you know to us when in the early stages when we were sort of realizing that we needed to build out more of an instructional platform, and those those um, you know Justin's an incredible person, super nice guy also, and you know he has similar kind of thing right, and so there was no master class you know at the time that like or a true fire existed of course, but it probably wasn't it wasn't the sort of massive platform that it is now. So this was a thing that took year, literally years and, and all the savings, like completely down the tubes, like, or not down the tubes, but it all went into this. Like whatever, whatever we've become now was the result of 15 years, like literally 15 years making lots of phone calls and building up a network and, and a resume for an industry I no longer work in. But you know, at some, sometimes you just, you're just like, that's what I'm going to do. You know, I'm, I'm, I was not meant for that. I'm, I'm meant for this. And this is whatever it is, good or bad, I, I'll fail at this or I'll succeed at this. But I'm going to do it. My parents were like, are you crazy? You know, they were <laughs> like, are you nuts? And, and I was like, I just, I think it'll work. It, I don't recommend that you do this, just to be clear. I, it, this isn't like a follow your dreams thing. It was a little more calculated than that. Like I thought, okay, I know things about the instrument that are, will radically transform. They radically transform the way that I played. And if this can be made into some sort of teaching something, like there is some way that this can be, I can make a living and it doesn't even need to be a, a huge one. It just needs to be, you know, a basic one so that I can put food on the table. And I was willing to do that because I didn't want to, you know, I, I had reached the end of my patience with doing the other thing. Like I was just total burnout and I couldn't do it anymore. And there were wonderful people in that line of work and, and, and it like taught me how to be an adult, you know, how to work in an office and make a phone call and sound like a person and not a scared kid, yeah. you know, and, and I will be forever grateful for that. But, uh, but no, there was no plan whatsoever and it took years. And, and I think just, I, even if you ask me now, I would say we're much closer to a complete thing, but we're nowhere near, you know, just the, at least we know what it needs to be now. It's a platform. You sign up, we take you from nothing. I mean, you could literally walk in the door with zero guitar playing skills and sign up for our, um, for our lessons. In fact, we have case studies of zero, like zero day people who don't play at yeah. all. And we said, here, pick up a guitar pick and do a tremolo and see what it looks like. Like we, that is literally one of the lessons that we have. Cool. So I, the vision is clearer now, you know. Yeah. But uh, uh, it wasn't a, at all, and and things are changing, you know, rapidly. It's an exciting time. And where do people find the the instructional uh, side of things now? Is that do you have a dedicated website, or is it through your YouTube uh, page? Well, the the all of our our what I keep calling the platform that's just TroyGrady.com, right? Troy so it's, it's the cracking the code. It's yeah, it's the cracking the code website. Um, should it be cracking the code guitar.com? Maybe, I don't, maybe we should go register, but, um, it just sort of started out with a weird hybrid, kind of like Justin guitar, except yep. that is his brand, Justin guitar, whereas our brand has always been cracking the code, but it, you get to it through my name, my personal website. And of course the YouTube channel is Troy Grady as well, but Instagram is cracking the code guitar and Facebook, I believe is just cracking the code. 
So it's a little bit of a mishmash there. But essentially, if you watch any of our YouTube features or you see some videos on Instagram and you're like, hey, I really want to learn that stuff, you head over to the website and you sign up. And you know, we kind of run you through the gamut of tests and other tricks that we figured out over the years to figure out what the hell you're doing and give you some pointers. And we've, you know, the, the, some of the most exciting stuff that we've done, honestly, is the real basic stuff. Like the metal primer from back in the day, the dog marks thing, where it's like, hey, here's your pick, here's you, how you hold it, and here's how you do, you know, you should use elbow or wrist. The tiny kernels of that, like, have been expanded into whole things where we've interviewed all these players that do a million and one different things. And it's like, well, what are the right ways? What are the wrong ways? How do you tell? Well, it's not so cut and dried. There, there aren't right and wrong ways as much as there are ways that work together and other ways that work together. And those two, you would probably not ever do, right? So like the Eddie Van Halen pick grip, yep. you would not do with a Molly Tuttle arm position, usually, because then you won't even reach the strings. But an Eddie Van Halen pick grip, you would do with an Eddie Van Halen arm position, but you would not use a Molly Tuttle pick grip with an Eddie Van Halen arm position, because then I couldn't reach the strings either. So there are reasons for these things. And it, it's not just personal preference. And then anybody who's like, oh, it doesn't matter. You just, you know, you do whatever. There's no right or wrong way. It's, it's dramatically, that's, it's bad advice that will set you back. And that's ignorant. And, you know, it took us a long time to learn some of these seemingly really simple things. It, it's a lot to take in, isn't it? Like, and it is very uh, situational what technique you're going to use at a particular time. I was showing a young student yesterday, just a, a couple of things. And um, I was very lucky that I clicked onto the Eddie Van Halen style tremolo picking very young i, I mm. think i may have read it in a guitar player magazine that he holds this, it in the middle you're talking finger about the forearm thing and just this the, the rotating yep yeah. i tell people it's like it's like you're opening a door uh right really really quickly and you, it's no not right. side to side like that but but like that um, yeah except his yeah, this, main picking motion is side to side though that's the trick with eddie is that this isn't his all-purpose picking motion yep. this is yeah. So with the same pick grip though. So those yep. are two different joint motions, as you're rightly pointing out. This one is the turning of the doorknob one. Yep. And that, you know, a lot of people saw that. And it's an, an incredible looking thing. Like, how could you not notice it, right? But the thing that he does that's weirder, or that that it, it took longer to figure out is when, you know, is more of the Steve Moore style, where, you know, he has his middle finger grip and he anchors here, but then he moves sideways. And now why is he doing that? Right. And and are there different ways to do it? it turns out there are. And they all have um, commonalities with what Steve Morse does and what Albert Lee does. I and mean, those are all players that have this middle finger grip, but they're using wrist motion, which is this side to side hand thing. So, um, you know, again, complicated because Eddie had like four different picking motions. You know, they were different. It was like different languages that he spoke and he would just switch from Italian to Spanish right in the middle of the solo. Like they're Spanish, literally Spanish, right? Little guitars. Yep. And, then, uh, and then back to, you know, his other motion, which he used more often for like riffing and, and you know, like Spanish slide type picking, that kind of thing. So is there a particular player that for you took a long time to work out just what the hell they were doing and, and you just went, ah, I finally see it. That's, that's what he's doing. Um, probably wrist technique. Uh, and that, that was a direct result of the work that we've done. Like, you know, for a long time, I just didn't know what I didn't know, right? So I just assumed I knew it all. Like I thought, oh, okay. Once I discovered how Ingve's technique worked, that was the initial breakthrough. And I just figured, oh, that must be the trick to all guitar playing. I didn't know there were other tricks. And when I say trick, I'm talking about the method that he uses to go from one string to another without hitting any of the wrong notes. So that sticky feeling that you get when you're trying to play something complicated, like a scale or something, he doesn't get that feeling because he's using an efficient picking motion that solves this problem of going from one string to another. And I did that by accident. Like I, It was sort of a controlled accident. I was watching Ingve's instructional video and trying to play Ingve style licks, and then I was just kind of screwing around one day, and I accidentally did it. And all of a sudden, I was able to play, you know, a complicated phrase that didn't have, you know, that moved across the strings and was easy. And once I figured that out, um, you know, you have this tendency to go and gather evidence where you're like, oh, well, that person must be doing the same thing. That person must be doing the same thing. And a lot of these, I was right. Like, I realized George Benson was doing basically the same thing. Eric Johnson was doing the same thing because I started playing those lines right away without even knowing, um, like, you know, like some of these phrases were phrases that I could immediately play. And it became obvious that that must be what those players are doing. Um, and, and so there's a tendency to think that everyone's doing that. And, uh, but then there are, there are things that didn't seem to, to work, like really obvious things, like, like whatever Paul Gilbert does, right? Like how does he play three note per string scales, picking all the notes? Technically, that's not a thing you ever see Ingve do. Ingve does not alternate pick scales that go across all the strings. He is a whole different way for that. So it didn't, it wasn't obvious for a long time what specifically what players like Paul Gilbert 
and Eddie Van Halen do when they're doing pure alternate picking that moves across the strings. And there's a, a connection with the kind of joint motion that those players use. They're all wrist players, and the wrist has special properties when it comes to picking motion. The wrist can make multiple different kinds of picking motion without involving any of your other joints. So like, if you think about it, if I just point, look, let's say I standardize my hand position, and we can all do this. You can just put your thumb to the left and your pinky to the right. Well, I can move side to side, right? But I can also I'm move straight up and down. It. Yeah, yeah, you can do you're right. You can move sideways, but you can also move up and down like dribbling a basketball. Yep. But you can also move diagonally as well. I can go this way, but I can also go this way. And it turns out that all these motions, this is how you play a scale with wrist technique. You need to make a different wrist motion at a different point in the sequence to go over the top of the string. It's not just a pure side to side motion. So when you see players like uh, Al Di Mola, like doing. Something that looks like a side to side hand motion. And that just looks like I'm doing this the whole way, but I'm not. I'm actually, and I'll exaggerate it, I can do it from this perspective. I don't know if you can see that I'm making a motion where the downstroke goes away from the guitar box. But then on the next string, I make the opposite motion. So now the upstroke is kind of moving towards my face a little bit. And now away, face. Away, face. That's how you play a scale with wrist technique. It's really effing cool. And of course, when you when you do this in reality, then you can't see it because the motions are like this big. Very small, you know, and, yeah. And he, yeah, even I mean, look at Al Miola. Would you consider him to have small motions? Really, like you know, when you see him doing the acoustic trio with John McLaughlin, you can see the motion. I mean, the hand, right? Yep. It's like this. It's not tiny. It's not like an Ingve thing with fingers. So the motions aren't tiny, tiny, but the changes in direction are, because these motions are mostly they they're they're only slightly different than side to side. So the when I'm saying the one picking motion kind of goes away like this, it's only very slightly away. If you imagine, let's say the strings is being flat like this, the downstroke one where it goes up in the air, only goes up in the air by a very small amount. It's not going like this. It's going like this, and the upstroke one where it goes up in the air. I don't know if I'm hitting the mic here, sorry. <laughs> it goes up in the air only by a very small amount. So the actual difference in the angle is probably about 20 degrees or something. And it, 20, it's just enough degrees. to not get caught to in get between over. the strings, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, the whole, whole premise that. is not to get caught in between the strings. Yes, and there's, but there's one other thing though. If you do it wrong, you end up with this. This bouncy kind of pecky appearing motion. That's what I call string hopping. And that's incorrect. So even though it, the downstroke is going away and the upstroke is going away, it's going away inefficiently. It's doing, it's doing it by reusing forearm muscles that get tired really quickly and you get a lot of arm tension. So in the case of string hopping, the, the simplest way that I can describe this is the string hopping way is where the downstroke needs to kind of go like that, right? Upstroke needs to go like this. So if I orient my hand so that the thumb and the pinky are going straight side to side, right? So let's say I go up that way. And then I go up this way, up that way, right? And let's say I make it really shallow, like you were saying, like just enough to get over the string, just shallow, right? Yep. Wrong. Why? Because the shallow motion that lifts this way uses these muscles here, the wrist extensors. The shallow motion that lifts this way also uses these muscles, the wrist extensors. So lift, 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 lift on every note. So it's not, the, the amazing fact about this is even if you try to keep these diagonals really close to the strings, it's not really alternate picking because the same muscle is being used on every pick stroke, it's not alternating. So the, the puzzle then becomes, how do I get over the string this way and over the string in the opposite diagonal, but not where the muscle usage actually alternates so that the one muscle can rest while the other one is, is happening. And the, the solution to this is totally freaking ingenious. And it's this, so the hand is not parallel to the floor anymore, it's tilted slightly. So now look what happens. If I want to go over the strings this way, how do I do it? I don't have to lift anymore. I just go sideways. See how if I go sideways now, I create a diagonal. Now if I want to go over the strings this way, I lift. So now instead of going lift, 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 I tilt the arm and I go lift, sideways, lift, sideways, lift, sideways. So to, another way of describing that would be if I make the arm parallel to the ground again, the actual picking motion I'm making is sideways, up, sideways, up, sideways, up. That's what Al 
and other players, and Paul Gilbert, and those players, Anton O'Parron, these great players, that's what they're doing. So when I go, if I do this on the low string, this motion here that's coming up towards my face is actually a sideways wrist motion. This motion, which is going away from the body, is actually the diagonal one that lifts, quote unquote. So I go right over the top of the A string here. And then on the A string, I come back towards my face again. This is the sideways one, right? So they use different muscles. The sideways motion uses whatever this muscle is here to go that way. Yep. And the lifting one uses this muscle here to go up. But because the arm is tilted, they both create a very shallow diagonal. And there's no speed limit with this. You can do this three note per string scale thing as fast as you want, and you don't, you can't sense the different diagonals of the motion when you do it. You don't feel, or I don't feel, like, oh, I'm jumping over the string or something like that. It just feels like moving your hand side to side. Which is why when you look at players like this, it looks like they're moving their hand side to side. And when you watch instructional videos like Intense Rock, which was Paul's kind of landmark, you know, how yep. to play a scale instructional video, they're not talking about this. I mean, they, they're alluding to the, at one point, Paul alludes to this need to get over the string. And, but the actual motion that does it is so uh, intuitive that um, you do it without really being able to sense. And this is specific to wrist technique. In, you know, in the Eddie Van Halen forum thing, I mean, it's super obvious, right? Everyone can see this. You're like, oh, I know what that is, you know? And the Ingve, even though Ingve is using finger motion and it's like this very small motion, he's picking only on the diagonal where the upstrokes go up in the air. And so he can do always, you ever notice Ingve only sweeps going this way? He only Dung, goes down. down, yeah. Yep. Yeah, because it's the, the pick is angled and it slides over the strings like this, whereas he never sweeps, never really sweeps this way or doesn't sweep well in this direction. He sweeps mainly in that way. He pulls so the off the last note. Again, doesn't he when he's descending? Yeah, well, sometimes. Sometimes? Sometimes. You don't have to. If you play an even number of notes, like um, the famous Ingve scale, right? So on the, the first string of that is all hammers. Then the next string has four notes, so I can just go down, up, down, up with that. No need to pull off because it's an even number of notes. And Ingve is basically using the equivalent of that sideways motion but he's not using wrist motion. Ingve is like a finger forearm thing. It's very complicated. Like if you watch Ingve play live, in the span of five minutes, you'll see, you know, 10 different slight variations on all these weird motions. You know, you'll see the fingers going for when he does the three note per string scale. That kind of thing is like a little finger motion that pushes. Yep. That's a sweeping thing. Yep. But when he does on a single string, you'll see more of what looks like a forearm and maybe a little bit of elbow. That, that kind of seems to be a slightly different cocktail of motions. But they all achieve the same end result, which is the pick moves along a diagonal where the upstroke goes up in the air. So the secret to Ingve, and this was the thing that I kind of stumbled upon accidentally in college, was that as long as you organize your lines so that the upstroke is the last note on the string, you encounter no roadblocks. And the only reason this works is that Ingve's picking motion moves on a diagonal where the upstrokes go away from the guitar body. A lot of ways you can do this. You can do it with like Ingve does with all this cocktail of form and finger motions. You can do it with gypsy technique, which is more like the Eddie Van Halen tremolo motion kind of. You can do it with wrist and forearm technique where you see a little bit of wiggling here and a little bit of sideways like this. So you see there's a little bit of turning, but also looks like the hand is moving a little bit sideways as yep. well. Yep. It creates the same end result. These are all, this is kind of why there's a family tree here. Like these players don't sound anything alike very often. The motions don't even look similar, but they're all united in that they make this diagonal picking motion where the upstroke goes up in the air. And that's a, it's a family of techniques. And as a result, much of the vocabulary or a lot of the vocabulary can sometimes repeat. There are lines that Sean Layden played, that Eric Johnson played, that George Benson plays. They all do the fast pentatonic thing starting on downstroke, even numbers of notes per string, like Zach Wilde is another great example of that. It's because they all pertain to this one, they all belong to this one family of motions where the upstrokes go up in the air. Um, so the wrist players do not. The wrist players are their own weird animal. So it, your question was like, why did it take us so long to figure this out? Because you can't see any of this stuff. Mm. Like you have to film somebody, you have to get a camera here to see that the pick is actually changing direction to get over the strings. And the player that did that for us was Andy Wood who you've talked to yep. uh, and Andy's Andy is this a phenomenal player and a phenomenal person. And uh, not the least of which, because he, he basically agreed to let us poke and prod all the parts, you know, yeah. to, and many multiple times over on both guitar, electric guitar, acoustic guitar, and mandolin. And it, his technique always works the same way. He does this wrist stuff. 
where if you ever watch Andy play, it looks a lot like Aldi Miola. Everything is kind of frozen above here. It's just this, you know. I think I turned the tone on. Right, so it's the hand moving and not the arm. And then to get over the string, he just kind of move, makes a slightly different motion this way and a slightly different motion this way. But if you do it wrong, you end up with that string hopping thing, which a lot of us, it's a prison a lot of us fell into where it's like, ah, it, just, sure. it feels like you can't you know, do it. But he has no problem. You ask Andy to alternate, pick any line, and it's not a problem. Even one note on a string, just like you know, switching those two different directions of the wrist motion like we we're talking about. So Andy was like a gateway drug for us where we finally got a camera a few inches away from somebody who's an expert level, like wrist play, playing scale player, and realize, oh, that's how this works. And that's probably, I'm guessing, what Paul Gilbert does. Maybe there's some other joints in there, but the, the concept is Paul basically looks like a wrist player. He's, you know, the hand moves and nothing else does. Other fantastic players like Anton O'Parin, um, another like virtuosic, wrist player, other players we've interviewed like Ali Soy Kelly, also mainly a wrist player and just kind of alters the direction that the hand is going to do all this crazy one note per string and scale playing and stuff. So wrist technique was, was, was something that I didn't even know existed, you know, however many years ago, even though it turns out I was doing bits of it, but I never would have figured it out if it yep. weren't for the cameras and the interviews and so forth. Do you find that any of the guests actually have no idea that that's what they're doing themselves? Are, are any of them are surprised when you film it and you show it back? Do they go, well, I'll be. I didn't realize I was doing that. Does that happen? Sometimes. I, yeah, it, all the time in various ways. But I think the way you got to look at it is it's, it's like asking a world-class race car driver how much they know about the car. And I just watched that Ford versus Ferrari movie, which despite being, you know, I was just like, this is the most American movie. Like, <laughs> just like, fuck yeah, you know. But I, I didn't, it, I wasn't sure if I was going to like it. But I, I'm a big uh, GT40 fan. You know, the cars, it's the beautiful thing and it's like this achievement so if you don't know what i'm talking about that's completely fine but uh you know in the movie that you know you get the perspective of what the driver thinks of the car and the car is very complicated the driver's not an engineer most of the time but they can tell you oh when i turn in it, it oversteers or it understeers or something or the brakes are fading or the tires are losing grip at certain points and i need more of this i need more downforce in the turns or whatever you know all these things so i think guitar players are supremely intuitive about what's going on but sometimes they're more intuitive to the result or they're more in tune with the result so much of like the technical of what's actually causing the result. So, um, you know, if you think about all the 50 things that are going on in picking technique, most players are aware of a lot of it, but they may not know, like they may never have looked at the picking motion in slow motion and they see, oh, look, it's making a semicircle. Like they didn't notice that, yeah. but they knew that there was a difference between doing that one and like the less efficient motion that the string hopping one or something. They all know that. Right, because they wouldn't be able to play like some of these complicated lines otherwise. So I think it's a little bit of an oversimplification to be like, oh, these players don't know what they're talking about. Like Ingve um, on the instructional video where he says, oh, I didn't, you know, I, I don't think about it. I mean, he thinks about it. He doesn't think about the mechanical of it, but he thinks about, okay, that was smooth, that worked, I'm going to do that again, but the other way doesn't work and I'm not going to do that. And like, oh, I have to use a pull off there. He's aware at some level. Everyone we've interviewed has been aware of at least a handful of very important things about their technique, but there's definitely that moment that you're referring to where they're like, oh yeah, look at it, it does that. Okay, yeah. But it usually correlates to 10 other things that they know about their playing. They just never like looked at you know, the video of it before. Sure. Now, Troy, something that I, I stumbled on in my own playing one time, I, I was playing Always With Me, Always With You. Satriani. Right. And Which I watched a, uh, earlier today and you did a great job with that. Oh, thank you, mate. There is a um a, a, a run, a three note per string scale run that he does. And mm -hmm. I was playing that one day and I thought to myself, I that feels like I'm picking half of that, but it sounds like I'm picking it all. What the hell am I doing? And I had to go back and watch a video of myself that I took on my phone to try and decipher what I was doing. And I just want to know if any if you've come across any players that do this, it was a three per string. I, I'm going to I'm going to try and say this is kind of like what I think Ingve does when he's descending. But I was doing this ascending, where I would actually right. start on an upstroke, and I would go mm. up, down, hammer, up, mm. down, hammer, up, down, mm. hammer. So every time I do that hammer, um, and the way I was angled, I'd end up out of the strings, wasn't getting caught right. in there. Yep. Who does that? Is there anybody out there oh, that? Okay. Like, yeah. Up down hammer on a scale. It felt so wrong, but sounded so right. It's like, that can't be right. I'm starting on an upstroke. Yeah, that's, 
Yeah, that's cool. And are you a Risk player? Do you use because that song doesn't have a whole lot of picking in it, really? Right. It's it's like, that's right. Yeah. It's it's just like slow lead playing. But if you had to do something that was like, uh, you know, if you had to play tremolo, for example, it looked like that. I tremolo Eddie Van Halen saw. Oh, you do this way. I do. Yep. Okay. Oh, you mean the rotational way? The rotational. Yeah. You do this. Yeah. You uh, and you do that for single note or like with an air gap under your arm like this, or do you Ooh. are you on the bridge? Let me grab a guitar and work that out. <laughs> Don't get me started. <laughs> uh, do I have a pick somewhere? There's one. That's not what I normally use, but that'll do. What do I do? Let me see. Let me just pull this okay. out a bit. I'm going to mess up my beautiful framing. Hmm. Right, I'm going to walk over to the, to the screen because we were talking there about the, uh, you the know, there is a gap tiny. between. I'm going to walk over here. There is there a is gap right. between again, my wrist and, and, and the bridge. Stand up in your in your filming location and do that, or or do you have a you can't hold the guitar? I am seated, so I can't quite. Oh, okay, uh, let me see. So lean, uh, lean, yeah, go ahead. Now you can get to see that I'm actually wearing pajama yeah, yeah. pants. <laughs> Huh. Not, oh, quite, yeah. getting the angle, okay, not yeah. quite getting the angle right there yeah, yeah, to be yeah, able yeah. to see. That sounds great. Um, that looks like, uh, yeah, it looks like rotational forearm motion. And do you only use that for tremolo or use that for uh, any? Just for the tremolo when tremolo. I'm doing that Eddie Van Halen okay. song. So the, the trick with that is a, a lot of times when you get this, this type of motion, you will, and, and you would need to look at it or film it to see this, but a lot of times you're creating an upstroke escape motion. And Eddie did this as well when he did the, uh, this motion. You know, uh, huh. right. So when I do this, the upstrokes are going up in the air. And the downstrokes, if you, if you do them too far, you may actually hit the body. Yeah, sometimes. right. So uh, I don't know if you're seeing that on your side or I can't tell from here, but when I do it, especially with this type of arm position where, the, where you can see a little bit of the underside of the arm here, and especially if any part of my hand touches the pick guard, you end up with what, what I call an upstroke escape picking motion, where again, the downstrokes go towards the guitar body and the upstrokes go up in the air. This is an Yngwie style picking motion, basically. So you can play all the Yngwie licks with this motion. Cool. and. You just have to make sure to play an even number of notes on a string. Now your tremolo motion sounds amazing there. It's super smooth and uh, it, you can launch right into it. Like, so it's very, it's clearly learned in your case. So this is a thing you can use for rapid lead playing. Um, and it, even Eddie does on occasion, you'll catch brief moments of live performances where he'll just play like a little kind of a single position phrase or something. Like yep. he'll go, he'll be playing a tremolo line and then at the end he starts doing actual fretted synchronized notes just yep. for a second, you know. Sometimes even across the strings. The trick is that you need to move from one string to another when the last note on the string is an upstroke. And or another way you can think about it is always starting on a downstroke and playing an even number of notes. So that all you're picking is in units of twos, down up. So down up, down up, down up, down up. And in a way you can almost just think of the downstrokes, just like down, 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 down. Like when I do this, I don't know if you can hear that, but I'm I just can, tapping downstrokes yeah, yeah, on, the, the, yep. on the on the pick guard, right? Right. So that that's actually alternate picking. That's actually alternate picking. If I were hitting the string, you would hear but because I'm only hitting the pick guard, you just hear only the downs. So that's how you actually synchronize that motion, only the downs. So if you play four notes on a string or two notes on a string, the upstroke will will allow you to move to the next string. You won't need the pull off unless the last note is a downstroke, or you do something like try to play three notes, which would be kind of awkward with this anyway. So that that motion, because you have it so well, you can actually, and it would be a cool project, just like whenever you have a few minutes to try yeah. and synchronize, get the left hand working with that and try to do some like real basic, you know, like uh, synchronized patterns, like, like uh, the Yngwie six note pattern. And when I do that, I'm just thinking about the initial downstroke of that pattern, and you can do that even with your middle finger grip, you know, in the uh, the rotational motion. Funnily enough, that is my go-to lick if I try and do that and not just have the single note Eddie thing. I will do yeah. that particular, but it's so hard to synchronize. So hard to synchronize. With the, uh, 
with this motion you're saying yeah 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 okay well uh, but you, I know you, the motion sounds so good though I, I think it's worth doing because like you know you would think that like oh it's a tremolo what's the big deal but that's the foundation like it um you know if you don't have a fast picking motion that's really smooth and has good attack like that i can hear even though you're not mic'd up i can or you're not plugged in i can hear the, the consistency and the attack there sounds really good i don't and need that's to plug the foundation in. of everything well no i know yeah well you've got right i have an that's, amp built uh, into this there is an amp in there there is an amp built into this this is a coolest okay. guitar somebody just asked somebody said whoa what the fuck is that guitar rick this is an electrophonic uh guitar yeah. modillo it's a model one okay. with a scratch proof um coating on it it actually has two speakers okay. in it yeah stereo effects and, and is, it supposed to be, is it is it a travel type thing or they like for buskers or something uh, both the, both it's a, positioning it? yeah company in california electrophonic um and it's a very cool guitar i, I that's what i play yeah. most of the time at home uh because and does it's so it have convenient. a mono it's just got a standard like quarter inch output on that or can you get a stereo it has on it? the quarter inch out if yeah. I get it up here. But it also has uh -huh. a smartphone in. I just got to hide my eyes so that it focuses on there. Oh, really? No, it's okay. not going to focus. It has yeah, a. Yeah, no, I know. <laughs> oh, I got it. Yeah, I it's see. Always it. away. Uh, it, it has uh -huh. a, a smartphone input so I can play backing tracks through it, um, mm -hmm. headphone out, all that kind of thing. Right. Um, very cool guitar. Very cool guitar. Yeah, no, it looks neat. Um, but I, I think, you know, whenever I hear a good sounding. It's funny. I mean, like, what, what is a good sounding single note, right? Well, I'm real into single notes sounding good because it's like you can, um, you know, you, you can do a motion, but it, you don't really ever get the motion right. There's a connection between the attack and, and the smoothness of it and the actual doing of the motion. And sometimes, you know, people think, well, I have to use the smallest amount of pick or the small motions. Not really. You have to get the best attack, which is it has to be positioned such the pick is sort of slicing through the string in a symmetrical way and you're not fighting with it. And everyone, we all learn this. Um, at some intuitive level, everybody kind of learns by feel when you're getting, like when it sounds ugly or when it sounds. You, know, like, yeah, you move it around and you get, oh, there's all these different attacks. And there's some spot there where a beginner will hit. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, now it sounds nice. Like it sounds good. And the, the downstroke and the upstroke don't even necessarily sound the same. They just sound smooth. Sometimes, you know, one is more of the dominant stroke. And it's not always the downstroke either. You film these things or you record you know in, into your sequencer you look at the actual notes of even a consistent tremolo and notice that like every other note will have a different look so the downstrokes will all look one way and the upstrokes will all look another way so um I, it, one, the most important first steps you can do is get that that single note you know motion sounding good and it's it's a combination of being able to do the joint motion but also having the right attack where the pick hits the string you know the right way and it sounds actually nice like you know just a a good sounding single note tremolo and that so that technique of yours really hits all those sweet spots i think it would be um it's certainly worth putting some time in to see if you can get some left hand synchronization yeah sync that up that is something I, I will work on troy out of all the people that you've analyzed their their picking uh who has had the strangest picking technique is there anybody that you've just um, gone wow that's just so different to anybody else what anybody else does I would say no. Uh, I think it's more the reverse of that, of looking at someone like Steve Morse, let's say, where, who is someone a lot of people, a lot of us would look at and think is weird. And then realizing that actually what Steve does is the same exact thing that what Andy does and what Molly Tuttle does. They each do it with a different arm position. And as a result, they have to use different pick grips. So even though Steve uses your style of pick grip and uses this arm position here, and it, it can look a little unusual and you see this and you're like, well, that's, that's weird. You shouldn't, you know, some people even think it's dangerous or harmful and, and it's none of those things actually. Um, but that, that technique of his is basically the same technique that Andy uses, but Andy uses a different pick grip and a different arm position. And then Molly Tuttle uses, and I say Molly Tuttle, but also Osnoy, David Greer, all these great players that use this style where they anchor on the thumb. It's still a wrist technique and they're still doing those two different directions of motions that we were talking about but they're just each using a different form for it. So the, the cool thing was realizing that there is a commonality in that world, the wrist technique world was so complicated and it took us a long time to figure that out. So realizing that the, the technique that looks weird on the surface actually isn't weird. And in fact, is, is actually really worth experimenting with also um, for anyone who wants to learn wrist technique. It's so not weird that I highly recommend that everyone try all three kinds of wrist motion 
the, the thumb side kind of Molly Tuttle, the Andy Aldi Miola kind, and the, the Steve kind, because one of them might just work. You might just be like, oh, look, I can do it. And it might be easy. And so, um, so I think, I think that's the coolest is like, you know, looking out on the freeway and seeing all the cars riding by and to an untrained observer, they all look bizarre. It's like an 18 wheeler and a Ferrari and, you know, but then to somebody who is an automotive designer, they're like, oh yeah, I get it. There's a suspension in the wheels and the engine, they all work the same. And the aerodynamic principles are the same, same kind of thing. So, uh, so that, that has been really, um, you know, realize, recognizing the commonality of all the techniques has, okay. has been really helpful. Yeah. How about someone like Marty Friedman, who has, just has a strange looking oh, yeah. picking hand? That's another great one. So he, he's not that strange, though. Like you can split screen, and I've done this. You can take Marty's technique and you can split screen it with amazing gypsy jazz players, and it looks exactly the same. Really? And Marty's form is, but yeah, I mean, that this this thing, right? Yep. You know, and he's he, his picking motion is an upstroke escape picking motion, much like your Eddie Van Halen tremolo motion, where the upstrokes go up in the air. And so all of Marty's licks are all downstroke sweeping. And even numbers of notes, so twos, fours, starting on a downstroke, terminating on an upstroke on every string. And you know, people they look at it and they're like, "Oh, it's just it looks looks so you know like it's going to be awkward or, or uncomfortable." But I mean, gypsy players are like they look like they could fall asleep doing this, you know. Yeah. And they have this bend in their wrist, but it's not like somebody's pushing on it like this. That hurts. If I do this and I push right away, it feels like something's going to come unattached yeah. in this area. But if I don't press, if I'm just resting like that there's no force pushing in this way it's not like fretting like in fretting technique you know you, you probably know that if you do something like this for any length of time it's you're gonna you're risking injury but that's because your thumb is attached here so if i push forward with my arm i'm applying all this massive amount of force across the joint here and you do this for any length of time trying to do these big stretches and it it hurts like it'll start hurting within like minutes of me trying to do that but you don't get that here because nothing is pushing here the, the hand is just sort of flopped over and there's no force there. And um, there might be some muscular, very minor muscular kind of activation here to keep it bent like that, but it's not, you know, it's not like that. And uh, I can play this way all day long. And I have, you know, for lessons that we've done where I've, I've taught this technique or this using this form and uh, it's the most comfortable thing. So um, Marty's technique is just another flavor of that. And the lines that he plays are very similar in structure to the kind of lines that a gypsy jazz player would play. So, um, you know, how we figured it out, I talked to him about that. And he's, again, another one of these intuitive players where he wasn't super aware of, I mean, he, he knew that he was doing it. He doesn't really think about, he doesn't interrogate why he does it. But he said that he has video going back to when he was like a teenager and it was already there. Like he was already was there, already. yeah. And, wow. Yeah, and he, he already, he locked right into it too. I said, you know the thing you do with your hand? And he goes, I was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, so he knows, he knows. And he likes to put up this facade of like, or the, he likes to project this image of like, ah, I don't worry about the details because that's his vibe, right? He wants you to, to play intuitively, but he's aware of certain things, yep. you know, and, and maybe he doesn't like to nerd out. He doesn't enjoy nerding out on it, but he definitely is aware that he has this form. And I'm sure he's aware of, you know, how that impacts his lead playing choices to a certain extent. Yeah. I have seen him reference it um, just on social media posts and everything. And he says he gets asked mm. a lot about it. Mm. Uh, Troy, what kind of pick do you use? Like you're so embedded in the whole picking world. What is your choice of pick? Right. Uh, well, all, I mean, another part of this journey was like learning what they're all good at. Right. So, um, so I've had to learn how to use all, all of the, the thing, all the tools because you don't want to show up somewhere and then somebody gives you something and you're like, Oh, I can't use that. So there are very few scenarios where I would say, Oh, I can't use that pick to do that thing. But there are certain kind of things that fit together that I've had to kind of figure out over time. And so some of these form choices and the grip choices only really work or, or are only most commonly paired with certain types of picks. So like your lead playing, you know, your rock jazz lead playing pick, the jazz three, probably being the classic example of that, it's an edge pickers pick. And what I mean by that is it's a pick that you don't really play where it's flat against the string, but you turn it so that some amount of the edge contacts the string. And so people that gravitate towards picks that have pointy geometry like this are very often edge pickers because if you play this flat against the string you get a very kind of unpleasantly lucky feel not so much the sound even but the feel is just like it feels smooth it doesn't flow but as soon as you turn this so that some amount of the edge hits the string and then you pick that way now all of a sudden it just this meaty feeling smoothness of the attack right and um and so this pick consciously or otherwise 
was designed for players to use with edge picking. And everything about it works this way. It's the thickness, the bevel, the point geometry. It's all designed for players who are coming at the strings at, with what I call an approach angle of like 25 to 45 degrees. And that's either from the arm or just because you're doing something with the fingers to create that. But ultimately, the pick wants to be hitting the string at this angle, and it wants to be going like this relative to the string. So this is a great choice for players, or, or any pick with this geometry, with the point, the bevel, this kind of, kind of thickness, but the bevel that, that uh, tapers down, is a great choice for certain techniques where you have a certain amount of edge picking. Flip side of that would be something like uh, bluegrass um, technique, where if you notice, most great bluegrass players use heavy gauge picks with a much more rounded point. And they very rarely use, or they use either very literal or no, in many cases, a zero edge picking. In other words, where the pick is placed completely flat against the string. And if you try to play with edge picking with a bluegrass pick, like um, I can grab uh, like a, one of these, like a blue chip, for example. This is a really popular pick that uh, bluegrass players use. This is the 346 design. It's that big fat triangle like Frank Gambale uses this also. If you try to do this with edge picking with alternate picking, even hear that it's almost no no it's just sliding all it's just a scratchy sliding kind of sound because the the rounded over point plus the edge picking is it's all there's almost no grip on the string whatsoever so these kind of picks are really designed to be played flat like that and they don't feel because they're fatter and because that point is rounder when you play it flat with no edge picking it actually feels a lot smoother than trying to play a jazz three flat against the string where um, the Jazz 3 just feels kind of uncomfortably plucky. It's too plucky to be played flat. It wants to be an edge picker's pick, whereas this pick wants to be played flat. So consequently, if you tend to play with less edge picking, if, you're, if you like to play flatter against the string, or if you, something about your form orients, let's say, the hand like this. You've seen this form before, probably, like Vinnie Moore plays this way. If you play flat against the string, a heavier gauge pick and a rounder point is your tool, probably. A super pointy pick with this type of form is going to feel somewhat uncomfortably plucky, at least to me. And you know, even though, again, you can do whatever you want, but when you look at what players do, you notice these correlations. Players that use less edge picking tend to use heavier gauge picks and rounder points. Players that use more edge picking tend to use pointier points. So um, my very long-winded answer to your question is I use whatever pick matches the technique that I'm using at that moment. So if I'm playing electric and I'm using an edge picking type technique, this, then I'll use something like a Jazz 3 or anything that's got a point, really. Wow, um, okay. If I'm using a flatter, if I'm playing flatter, like on acoustic, doing bluegrass especially, the kind of this, the formula for that is zero degree edge picking, flat against the string, the heavy gauge pick, and a rounded point. And so I'll just use those picks for that. And of course, the, the all rounder, the really great all rounder, is the Fender 351, which is that the pizza shaped pick that every you know that what everyone thinks of as a guitar pick. Yep. It's a little bit rounded over at the end. So if you use any more than about 20 degrees of edge picking or so with that, you start to get that slidey feeling that you get with the blue chip, and you can't. It's just too, you know, you're sliding, you don't really get enough grip at that point. So the 351 can be played flat, especially if it's a heavy gauge pick, or you can use a little bit of edge picking with that. So it's a great kind of in-between of the, if you can't make up your mind, or you tend to play with a low degree of edge picking, say a low amount, but not totally flat. Or even, you can even play a um, great acoustic player we interviewed recently, Bill Hall, or a great player in general, but he does a lot of acoustic playing, and he plays completely flat on the string, and he uses a heavy gauge, 351 style point. So it's the rounder point, flatter on the string, and gets a real nice sound on acoustic. Um, so it, it has to match. There, there are these correlations. And re in reality, all the tools kind of work. I, I kind of use them all. It just depends on what technique I'm, I'm teaching, maybe. Cool, cool. I, I had a bit of a change in uh, my choice of pick a few years ago. I, yep. um, I used to use the green Jim Dunlop riffs because of the grip on it and the fact that if I dropped it on a black stage, they were fluorescent green and I could find it. <laughs> yeah. But they were... Riffs, I don't know them. They're probably a 0.8 millimeter, um, but they had a bit of flex about them. And I was at NAMM a couple of years ago. I was walking along and I bumped into Andy James. And uh -huh. I yeah. just going, oh, Andy, man, i got to say, you're one of the, the cleanest pickers that I've ever heard, you know, of all the Instagram guys and that. And he sort of leaned into me in, in his thick English accent and said, i got a secret. And he puts his yeah. hands in his pocket and pulls out this really thick pick, which was his signature right. pick that was about to be released. And he gave mm -hmm. me one of those. And I took it home and I started playing. And after a while, I went back to my old pick 
And and I've heard Guthrie say this before, and it's a great analogy. It felt like trying to write with a rubber pen, like my mm. old flexible pick. So right. now I can't use anything with any flex in it. It has mm. to be big and thick. And I was looking around before as you were talking, trying to find one of the picks that I use. Uh, yeah. It's very similar to this. This is the pointy version of it. Uh, but what is it? It's a, a chicken chicken pick. Chicken pick. Oh yeah. Yeah, I know. Is that, that going to focus on me? It's not. Yeah. It's no, it's not. Is it? But it's a very yeah. very square. Mm -hmm. uh, not square. Sorry, very triangle sharp. Yeah, it's I, sort I of used a the rounded version of that. Type. It's kind of yeah. like a three forty six design. The tri the equilateral shape. Right? Yeah, yeah. But it's got that's got the bevel on it though. That one. Yeah, that that was a very pointy one, which I don't use. I should have a pick somewhere. I'm just going to have a look on the other side of the mm -hmm. camera here. Yeah. No, I was playing with it just before. I've dropped it somewhere. But yeah, I've just found that there's just a snap about that mm -hmm. about using that pick that I really enjoy. And you brought and up the Fender, gauge, right? the original Fender ones. And I got to say, I've got one right there. But mm -hmm. I discovered when I was quite young that I'd snap those. Break them I must in. hit hard <laughs> when I'm playing rhythm guitar. So that uh, always. You're talking about the celluloid ones yeah, that yeah. have that, it's a plastic -y material, mm, right? Yeah. 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 You can definitely rip a celluloid pick, especially the thinner ones, like the, uh, the strummy kinds, like a, like a 40, like a 50 or something or 60.6 of a millimeter, like celluloid. You only get about half a song out of that before it literally rips, you know, like the, the, that material in particular, yep. but that was like the first really professional guitar pick material. That wasn't a tortoise shell was celluloid. It was the closest yeah. thing that they had in the twenties, the nineteen twenties. That sounded like uh, sounded like tortoise shell, and still, it's, it's a good all rounder material, especially in the heavier gauge. You know, like up around a millimeter or so. It's a pretty good all round pick. That with a three fifty one point, maybe. But the chicken pick ones, um, those are very heavy gauge usually, right? They are, like and a, they're the one pick that I've come across that I don't destroy every time I do a, a pick scrape. The the one pick uh -huh. I was looking for, I've been using that one pick for one maybe two years i've got a, a little stash of them but that one it barely mm -hmm. has any scratches on the, on the edge uh whereas all the other ones that i've tried as soon as i do a big pick scrape <sighs> there goes the edge and it's like ah, <laughs> damn it <laughs> but, it's a um, message they're telling they're sending you a, a signal not to do the pick scrapes yeah they must be they must be troy i did want to ask you one thing and i'm just going to let the folks know that, that are watching i'm going to throw to you yeah. your question soon so please oh, if you okay, have any sure. questions for troy Chuck them in now, and I'll, I'll scan through and have a look at the ones that are already in there. What I wanted to know, Troy, is when I'm practicing, I sometimes think maybe I should anchor uh, some fingers on on the guitar as I'm picking. Other right. times I'm thinking, no, curl the fingers up. What would you recommend? Leaning on there? Uh, it, it doesn't matter. It's doesn't just matter? Just different techniques. Yep. No. Um, yeah, they're just different techniques. Like you'll notice, for example, we talk about wrist technique. Most wrist players don't touch the guitar. And if they do, very often you'll see that it's not just wrist anymore. So when players play like this, you'll see a little bit of the arm kind of fire up because it provides sort of a natural, I think there's some sort of tactile feedback there that's saying, okay, well, this maybe doesn't want to move or doesn't want to move as much. But now I can do something that looks maybe like this where I've got, you know, there's some wrist motion happening here. But there's also some arm turning, right? So when I when I touch the guitar, it's just a sort of a trigger in my mind to in, to do a different type of picking motion. Um, also, you have to bend, you have to flex down to reach the guitar body, right? So wrist technique very often looks like this, extended. In other words, you want the pick to touch the string. Well, if I go down here, well now I'm too low, right? So if I if I touch the body now I'm too low. So now I got to turn the arm. Well, now I've just I'm, I've morphed into a whole different technique at that point, right? So it's not really a question of touching the body or not touching the body. It's which technique do you want to do? So if you're doing like a Doug Aldrich kind of thing, where you know the fingers are out and they graze, or an Ingve kind of thing, a lot of those players are upstroke escape players. They're players that do like what we're talking about, where the, the upstrokes go up in the air. So um, by contrast, wrist players that have the double escape or the, the mixed escape capability, where they can move to a new string when they play a downstroke or an upstroke, most of those players or a lot of them play with the curled fingers like an Al Di Miola or John McLaughlin style because these wrist positions are usually extended wrist positions. They go up in the air a little bit. So if I try to do this, now I've changed my whole forearm geometry around. Notice I've, I've tilted, I'm sort of leaning on this right sort of side of my, my, uh, of my palm there. Right. Oh. 
So now you've got. So I've got muting now because the right side of my palm is touching the string. Right? But now I'm, look at how different the form is anymore. Compare this to Demiola or Andy Wood. Right? Here's Andy Wood or Demiola. Here's D, like Doug Aldrich or something. Completely different arm position, or not completely, but different enough that if I tried to do my downstroke escape motion, now I'm hitting the string. So to play the scale and um, to try to get over the string when I play downstroke doesn't really work anymore, at least not with the, this kind of motion, which is similar to your tremolo motion. It's like an anchored version of this. So it's just a different technique, basically. So it's, a, it's a not a real question. People are like, oh, I shouldn't anchor, I shouldn't anchor. That, you're asking the wrong question. The question you should be asking is, what technique are you trying to use? Use that technique and play the lines that it works with. But it's not like there's a good or a bad to the touching of the guitar body. They're just different. How about guys that are known for the down picking, down striking, like James Hetfield? Has he got something special right. going on that allows him to down pick so ferociously for so long? I, <laughs> uh, I don't, I mean, I don't know. I don't think so. J James particularly looks like a wrist player. And so we keep coming back to like these families, right? Um, there are different ways to do the downstroke thing. Um, for sure. And we've interviewed some really good players that, that can do that kind of stuff. Brendan Small is a guy that I interviewed. He did, um, he's a sort of multi, um, a polymath genius. This is, this is his, uh, band Galact or this is his, uh, solo project Galacticon. Cool. And, uh, it's like a death metal for nerds. If you, uh, death metal for, for film nerds. Um, if you, if you ever watch the TV show Metalocalypse, which was the, uh, sort of artfully done parody of a metal band, that's his show. And he wrote all the songs and played all the parts on that, which is really pretty amazing. And uh, so he's, he's a great example of a player that has multiple ways of doing the different downstroke techniques. So he has a, um, a forearm wrist way, which is kind of like your dog Aldrich sort of thing. Like you see a little bit of wiggle here and then the hand kind of popping away from the string. This kind of motion this is very common. You get the right side of the hand on the strings here and you can see, you know, you get, you're muting that way. But this sort of forces both of these joints to work again, like we were saying with, where you're touching the body. If I'm leaning over in this direction, well, it's not so easy to do wrist motion anymore because I'm hitting the body. So now I, I can do a little wrist motion and I can also do a little forearm and you'll notice some wiggle in this part of the arm. This is more like what Kirk Hammett does, right? So if you watch Kirk do the downstrokes, you'll see this kind of thing happening. Whereas if you watch Hetfield, it's just hands, right? It's just the hand moving, not the arm as much. So Brendan also has that version. <laughs> Something like that, right? The hand is moving and not the arm. And all these techniques, what, what they have in common is that they create a picking motion that makes like a little circle. Because you're hitting the string in the one direction, but you don't want to hit it on the way back. So you're, you're kind of just barely missing it on the way back. And the faster you go, and this maybe is kind of the trick that you're alluding to, is you know what's the trick to being able to do this really fast? The trick is that the faster you go, the more the motion looks like a straight back and forth motion. And the circle part of it gets so squashed that on the way back, it just barely misses the string. So it doesn't look so much like a really pronounced circle anymore. It looks more like almost exactly like back and forth straight line picking, except that you're only hearing half the notes. It, there's no alternate, mo you know, the upstroke is not hitting the string. Or in the case of all upstrokes, which is a thing that exists, only the upstroke hits the string and the downstroke doesn't. So you can actually do... Do stupid fast upstrokes, and I find that to be super easy. Why? Because look at the motion I'm making. It's this. Remember the, the basketball yep. dribbling motion? Do this on your guitar right now. You can probably do that stupid fast. Yeah, I can get it yeah. pretty quick. So you see how fast that is? Yep. You get a metronome out. Do that. Here's check this out. Do that. Do that again. How fast is that? Can you hear that? Yeah. I'll, I'll just hear. lower my mic. Yeah, yeah. Tap on the guitar. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to turn on my metronome. I'm going to tell you how fast that is that you're that you're going. Just just to impress yourself with how fast that is. That's about it, right? Here's here. That's 240 beats a minute that you're doing there. That's like 30 BPM faster than Master of Puppets, just so you know. Cool. Actually, yeah, it's about like it's like 25 to 30 BPM faster than Master of Puppets. And you saw how easy that was, right? Like you could do that, you know, players that are really good at this, they're very relaxed. 
the hand does flexion and extension wrist motions really fast. And I can do it all upstrokes. Why? Because it's not really an upstroke, it's a tap. That's how I think about it. So if I do this, it feels like a downstroke to me because I'm tapping towards the body of the guitar. I just do it on a string. You know? Now, if you try that, here's the cool thing. You may screw up and sometimes actually alternate pick at those stupid speeds, like actually alternate pick at 220, 230, 240, which is way faster than like Ingve ever played on a record, way faster than a lot of these players go. And you can do it. Most people can actually already do this. I mean, here's the test for it right now. Everybody watching this stream, go grab your guitar, set your metronome to 240 and tap eighth notes. You can do it. Trust me, you will. And you can probably go faster. You can probably do 250, 260. I've done 250, 260, even 270 with this. It just depends like how awake I am that day. And I did not work on this. I never worked on this. I never, I've never even listened. I've never tried to play Master of Puppets or any of the death metal songs. I think that most people just are very, very fast with flexion, extension, wrist motions, and they just don't know it. So there's, if you want your trick, that's the trick, is that Hetfield's arm position is this. It's more of, you know, he used the middle finger grip, right? So he's got this kind of arm position. So his motion is more like this. That's the trick, if you want one, right? And why can he do that really fast? Well, I mean, 220, here's the crazy thing. Do that tapping on the guitar next time you have a few minutes. Put your metronome at 220 and realize how stupid easy it is. You feel like you could do 220 all day long. And wow. that's Master of Puppets, right? Yep. So now Master of Puppets all of a sudden becomes super attainable once you realize you already have the speed. So this whole like building up to speed, using exercises, going to the gym, it's not real, people. You don't need it because you already can do it. You just don't know how to do the techniques. So anyway, the downstrokes, the upstrokes, they're all just taps to me. Super fast taps. Is what okay. Is. Now, cool, how about right? tension? Is tension something that you you focus on on trying to not have tension? Uh, I find some of the things uh, that I try and play sometimes it pays to to tense up, and I get almost like a a twitch happening in a muscle. Other times, I completely yeah. relax and it gets faster. Is tension something right. that you've put time into? Um, it depends, right? What kind? I mean, in general, I think it's you'd be more right than wrong if you were to say that any kind of feeling of soreness and stiffness is bad. Because again, the tapping thing, when you do that, you probably feel something here, right? I mean, the tapping is a great example of what a technique where you might say, well, it, I need to give it a little gas, but it shouldn't hurt. It shouldn't be like going to the gym where you feel like, oh, I was really sore after I did my workout. That's not it. This is a purely a neuro thing. It's a neurological thing to be able to fire the nerves fast enough to go. and. I notice that when I get tired with this, I start feeling it in my pec and my shoulder, other things, because they're not involved. If they start trying to help, it's because this guy's dying. Yeah, it's right. like I'm doing something wrong and I'm firing the wrong neurons, you know? So I, I think it's purely a skill thing. And I think the tension basically reduces to a minimum the better you get at things. So I would generally, again, I would say, as a, if you want a blanket answer, my blanket answer is that tension is a sign that something is wrong most of the time. If we're talking about these hyper-picking things, what we call hyper-picking, these 220 plus speeds, right? There is a certain amount of kind of base level flex that needs to be there. A lot of times, even with these wrist motions, like the tapping, I, if, you know, when I do that, there is kind of a general flex that's happening here, but it's not painful. And it shouldn't feel painful. And I would rather err on the side of safety because so many guitar players have self-destructive tendencies and will go and practice for hours. They're going to work through the pain, horrible impulses that no one should have. Like, and a lot of it is psychological. Like, I, I feel bad about my picking today or my playing today, and I want to try. I want more because I want to have that moment where I feel good about things. That's a psychological issue. It's not a guitar playing issue. Your best guitar playing most of the time feels pretty effortless. And even these hyper things, which do have a slight amount of athleticism to them. I mean, how long do you think Hetfield would be able to do that if he was like all, you know, yeah. he wouldn't last three bars, yeah. you know? Yeah. So I think it's really important that people pay attention to their bodies. But I think certainly I can say for anything less than maybe 210 beats a minute, no tension, zero. You want yep. nothing. Yep. You should feel nothing. And if you do, it's probably wrong right? Or it's a sign that you're new with something and the peck is firing, the delts are firing, and they're not supposed to be. They're not involved, but you don't know that yet because you haven't figured out how to just move the hand. So if I say go fast with your wrist and your whole body goes, it's because you're new. And you got to figure out 
how to target just the hand without the rest of you going nuts. And you will figure that out, but that's a trial and error thing. It's not a gym thing. It's not like hammering away at reps. Don't do that. You're just gonna you run the risk of injury. Don't do it and don't do it for huge amounts of time, even if, even if it's unavoidable to some extent. Yeah, finding that state of being relaxed is, is a very foreign thing to a lot of people. I know for me, when I was trying to learn to just relax and play faster lines, mm-hmm. uh, it's not so easy to do. It's not so easy to do. I mean, to just- I don't, I guess, I mean, I've never really thought about it, but I think if you just find some activity that you're already really good at and you ask yourself, what does my body feel like when I do this? it'll probably be pretty relaxed, like especially a hand-eye coordination kind of thing. If there's something like the table tapping, and we, we start out our, you know, our pathway starts with all these tapping tests just to prove to people that you actually have this ability. You just haven't maybe tapped into it yet. But find some activity that you're really good at. You don't have to be in some super zened out, you know, weed smoking mode like to be relaxed. Relaxed, you can be alert and you can even be on high alert but you're not flexed all over the place. You know, not every muscle is flexing because that you won't make it half a bar with that, you know? So I, I think it's more about understanding what it feels like when you're doing something efficiently. And that, that feeling can even be slightly athletic, like these hyperpicking techniques, but it shouldn't feel painful and tense. And it doesn't have to be like you're falling asleep levels of, of Zen. I mean, maybe some of that can help you if you have problems with this, but, um, but like I don't, I'm very engaged you know, when I'm doing high energy playing, like, and I'm, and I'm into it, but I could do it all day. It's not physically stren- strenuous. So I'm going to throw to some of the questions that the people have um, chucked up on the chat room. Um, yeah. Now, the very first one, I had somebody ask me uh, when they saw the thumbnail I did up, did up for the event uh, that asked about yeah. your guitar. And the very first question that has popped up uh, is, Troy, is the Fender Mustang your favorite guitar to play? And is that is that what you got there, a Mustang? <clears throat> This is a Duosonic, actually. Duosonic. Which was the, is the mid-60s version. It's basically a Mustang with, with a hardtail. Cool. And uh, I like this. This is my favorite guitar design in the sense that you may not notice this, but this is a 22 and a half inch scale length because I'm a smaller person. So I want to put a guitar here, and I don't want to reach all the way out here like a, you know, on a 25 and a half inch neck. I want the chords to be here. Um, it's not even really a fretboard stretch thing. It's, it's a reach thing, and it's also a body size thing. Like... Interestingly enough, you can put a Les Paul on my right leg, and the nut for the Les Paul at 24 and three quarters will be in the same exact spot as the nut. We're very close to this 22 and a half. The difference is the ass end of it sticks out all the way. Yeah, over right. Here. So when you stand up, now it centers itself, and now you're reaching again. So the Les an SG Paul always felt like that to me. Seated. Gibson SGs what? always felt like that to me, where everything felt oh, like. Oh, they have a long. Yeah. This way. Yeah, yeah. there's a reach. So reach is, is one of the concerns because. It's wherever the, the, uh, the waistline of the guitar is, wherever it sits. Um, interestingly, another really extreme example of this is here. I'll, I'll grab this, actually. I'll just plug in. This is really cool. Here is your Martin Dreadnought. This is like the biggest guitar you can play, pretty much, besides maybe a Gibson Jumbo or something, right? So if I put this exactly where it sits, check out where the nut is. I mean, it's almost bang on exact. Yeah, right. Like the reach is, is almost identical. And this is a 25 and a half inch scale. And this is a 22 and a half inch. So this guitar isn't as small as you think. Like, in other words, when you put this on your leg, if you're a right leg player the way that I am, the D chord is in the same damn spot. Exactly. The difference with, of course, the, the, um, the Dreadnought is just how big the box is. So for me, I actually can't, like a lot of Dreadnought players, form-wise, will reach around like this. Not quite Johnny Cash, but they'll come in, like Andy Wood comes in from about here. Okay. But I can't. I can't get, I physically can't, he, he crooks it kind of like here where the bicep hits the body. Yep. I can't reach the sweet spot from that. I'm at the bridge here. I have to, and you can probably see it's worn out here. I have to come over the top of the guitar. So this guitar is too big for me to use Andy's technique. So this is some of the, the this is where we were talking about like there's no right way, but there are rules. Yep. So if you want to use his form, well, that doesn't work for me because I'm not big enough physically and I don't have long enough arms. It's really just an arm length thing. I have short arms. I can't reach the sweet spot. I want to be picking about here, and I, the best I can do with Andy's technique is here. So I can use Molly's technique because Molly uses a thumb anchor and, and sits right on the strings. So I can come more vertically, and she does. If you watch her playing, her arm is almost, you know, her approach angle is much higher. So Molly's technique with the thumb side anchor like this is a much more appropriate technique if you force me to play the big guitar. What does that also mean? Well, that means I'm going to have no edge picking. 
So what do I need? I need this pick with the rounded over point. All the pieces have to fit together. So the size of the guitar, amazingly, is telling me I have to use this pick. How crazy is that? Right? Wow. So what, why do I play these guitars? Because um, they're smaller. They're sized more for someone with my body size. And uh, the 22 and a half inch scale length is my favorite scale length. I run 11s on these, and it feels kind of like 10s on a Les Paul, I guess. I mean, yep. it's not super slinky, but I don't like to go really. I don't like the spaghetti feel. Okay. I don't need, it's not a macho contest. I'm not yep. like Stevie Ray Vaughan. Yep. But I don't, uh, the, the real problem is for me, um, if I pick softly, I want a soft sound. And if I pick loudly, I want a loud sound. And if I pick medium, I want a medium sound. So if the string is too spaghetti, then all pick notes, like my entire dynamic range gets squeezed down into the difference between mega soft picking and ultra mega soft picking. <laughs> it's like I can only use the mega softestest picking, you know, motions. And to do that, I have to let the pick wiggle and like everything becomes like, I feel like I'm playing under a microscope. Like I can only, you know, and if you're a legato player or something and you don't pick much or you, you use tiny finger motions, maybe that works for you, but it doesn't work for like gypsy jazz or any of the other things that I have to teach. So I need the string to fight back a little bit. I don't, I'm not crazy. I'm not trying to bend, you know, 13s yep. or something. Yep. Although the, the dreadnought runs 13s. That's a medium, you know, amazingly bluegrass players. That's a, that's a medium. Wow. <laughs> right? Wow. I've gotten so, lighter and lighter with my strings as I've gotten older. Um, yeah. I, I had a bit of a run with tendonitis and I, somebody gave me a set of eights mm. to try and that was, right. I liked it. I liked it. Uh, it on 25 and a half inch scale though, right? Yeah. Fender on scale. On a Fender yeah. scale length yep. guitar. Yeah. I wouldn't do that on a, like a Gibson at Les Paul would probably be just, I would That'd think it would be, be almost unplayable. But, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm going to kick on through the questions there. Caleb Thomas yeah. says, Hey Troy, I was wondering how you would practice fast stuff once you have the speed and just need to develop consistency slash accuracy. Could you show us a glimpse right. into how you work on that? Right. So, I mean, I think you have to think of this as a spectrum, right? There's not like a point where it's like the one challenge ends and the other one begins. If you think at the very, very end points of the spectrum, traditional music advice is really geared for people who already have music tech, who already have instrument technique. All the advice that they'll give you in like a music conservatory where they're like, okay, you're learning the new Chopin piece. Well, you can't play through the whole thing yet. So you need to take these two bars and work them up and then the next two bars and work them up. And now you can connect the four bars together and then you work them up. And then if there's a flub in there somewhere, you rewind a little bit and just repeat that part. Those are all challenges that work best when you already have the technique that you need to play the instrument, right? And the, so the question that Caleb is asking, if that's you, if you're like a good keyboard player already, you can use basically what you think of as traditional music instrument technique teaching to solve those problems. If the mistakes are ones that relate to the piece being unfamiliar and not so much the technique being unknown, if that makes any sense. It's like the difference between like learning how to stand up on a surfboard and the difference between learning how to surf in some new location where the, the patterns, the wave patterns are different. You're like, oh, it goes this way. Oh, I see. Yeah, okay. I got to remember, I got to go that way when I reach a certain point, right? So it, you're, you're not learning to balance on the board again. You already know how to do that, but there's something different about the one piece than the other. So tr let's call it conservatory style music practice works for that because what is that practice? It's, it's such a vague word. What is conservatory style practice doing? It's learning, it's helping you memorize an unfamiliar piece with familiar motions. In other words, motions you already know how to do, but the sequence of them is new to you. So like, you know, the Chopin piece has this combination of notes and the, uh, the list piece has these other combinations of notes. And, but I can do all those combinations. I know them all. I've done them already. I just have to remember that the, this piece has this one, this one, this one. It's much more of a memorization challenge. Flip side, at the other end of the spectrum, you can't even do the technique yet. And not only can you not do the technique, but you don't even know what the correct technique is half the time. Like if you're trying to play bluegrass and you have to do these crazy, you know, you know one note per string roll patterns, most people will do that, you know, with the wrong motion, this bouncy string hopping motion that we talked about. Well, that's not gonna work. Well, what technique is gonna work? Well, before cracking the code, there was no, you know, you couldn't watch slow motion video of somebody doing this. And even if you can, here's the, the real mind fuck, is even if you can watch slow motion video of Molly Tuttle doing it, it's not necessarily obvious how to do what she's doing. So no matter what, even if you're sitting 
five feet away from Molly Tuttle and she says, okay, anchor here and do this. Well, that's a nice hint, right? But you still have to be the one to do that motion correctly. And I can, I can use her anchor position, her approach angle, her grip, her, um, her thumb side anchor, you know, the same guitar size, same string, same pick, all the stuff we just talked about. I can do that and I can still do the motion wrong because I can still make a string hopping motion with all of those form elements. So at some level, there's always a gap in teaching from knowing how a thing works or even thinking you do to actually doing it correctly. And even then half the time you won't know you did it right. Cause like you might've done it right for the first five notes and then done it wrong for the next. Or even worse is like with a roll pattern, you might get some of the notes might be correct, but there might be one or two string hops in there. And how do you know? It just all feels a little bit right and a little bit wrong at the same time. How the hell do you know? So there's always that, that void between the knowing and the doing. And even with a teacher, even with somebody sitting right here, even with the best cracking the code videos, until we have the matrix where it's like, you know, where he goes like, or she goes, tank, I need a, I need a helicopter program for a whatever, whatever. And they just load it into her brain. Until we have that, you know, the, I know Kung Fu, right? That moment he's like, <laughs> Kung Fu. Until we have that, I cannot implant the feeling of doing it right in your brain so that you'll recognize it. So there's always this feathering from going from the, I don't know how it's done to the, I'm the conservatory person where it's perfect every time, but I just have to learn new pieces. There's not a hard cutoff there. There's some big gray middle area where you're kind of doing it a little bit wrong on some days and some days the anchor's a little different. You don't even realize it. And you're like, why does this feel different? I don't know. And then the next day you come back and you're like, whoa, this is so good. Why is this so good? And you don't even know why. Yeah. That just fades over time. As you become more familiar with what the correct anchor point feels like and the correct whatever. So I, there's not an easy answer to this question, but you have to ask yourself what is the challenge that you're trying to surmount. Can you do the technique correctly? And, and are you sure? And can you do it correctly on the wide array of picking patterns that you're gonna need to play a song? Because if not, then there's still motor learning there. They're still learning the unfamiliar motion. If your challenge is learning the unfamiliar motion, the only way to do this is to repeatedly try and try and learn and to recognize when it's correct versus when it's not correct. Because again, you can do the roll pattern even sort of fast, but with the couple of string hopping motions here and there, and you'll get a little arm tension, but not a lot. And you think you got it, but you don't really have it until you can do it at you know 150, 160, 16th notes. And that's like a blazing fast speed for bluegrass for that kind of thing. So if you could know, if you could teleport into Molly's brain and get the feeling of, oh, that's, oh, okay, I get it. Then you would know. Yep. You'd be like, oh yeah, no, that's totally not it. I'm just, I'm just, you know, fooling myself. Yep. All right. I got to keep going. Got to keep finding. So the thing that the geniuses did that the rest of us maybe didn't do as well is somehow they knew they were like, yeah, that's not right. I'm not going to do that. You know, and Ingve somehow figured out that if he picks even numbers of notes and uses the pull off or whatever, like it's going to work. Somehow he knew to avoid all the other crap that wasn't working. And he knew to just focus on the thing that was working. How? I don't know. But I didn't because I was banging my head against the wall for years trying to play the you know, just feeling nasty and not knowing how to not be nasty about yep. it. Yep. So, so again, the, the short answer to the, or the long answer to this question is there isn't a smooth cutoff, but very broadly, you have the two extremes. One is I don't know how to do the technique. And one is I do know how to do the technique, but I don't know the piece. And there is a long protracted feathering process between those two. And that involves a lot of trial and error over time with a wide variety of music of different patterns, different pieces, because everything gets better all together. You don't just master one thing and then the next thing. Everything gets better as you learn to recognize with more confidence over time that the motion I'm making is correct, is efficient, and oh yeah, I, I played that picking pattern before. Yeah, I can totally do it. Fretting's a little different, but yeah, no, I got that. And that feeling will develop over you know, a period of a couple of years or something with, depends on the technique. But generally speaking, that's, there's a long tail to this process. Troy, you mentioned about uh, being up close to somebody doing that. You said about being next to Molly and you still wouldn't be able to work out what, what's going on there. Man, I had the pleasure of hanging out uh, in Germany a couple of years ago at an event called 42 Gear Street. Uh, I hosted a, a little guitar battle between Tom Quayle and uh, Sammy Bowler. And I was talking to, to Sammy afterwards. He's going, I've never been up close to anybody that can play like that before. And uh -huh. I, I was asking... Um, Tom about his about his picking. I put the camera right up as he was picking. He had a lot of hybrid picking with fingers and things going on. It was like a 
like a spider, but it is mind blowing to be next to somebody like that. And it wasn't until I stuck the camera right up next to his hand that I could actually see what was going on there. So yeah. And man, what, yeah, he's what awesome. an amazing he's thing to be next to somebody playing that. So you must've had several experiences like that by sticking cameras oh, yeah. on people's guitars. Every time. I mean, uh, Every time I, that someone walks into this room, like we're, we're privileged to have that, like, oh my God, there I'm sitting next to somebody who's going to melt my face, you know? Yep. And, um, but the, but the teaching thing is, or, or the, the learning the technique, even what I'm suggesting is even with the video, you can know what they're doing. you like, I can know intellectually, oh, I'm supposed to be making this kind of motion. You can still do it wrong because you have to do it by feel. You can't look at it. And, and the other thing, which somebody's probably going to ask is you can't do it slowly and then speed it up. Cause that's, like weird. There's no thing that you've learned to do in your life where you, no one learned to walk that way, like a robot where you like, I mean, you learn, you know, eighties, you know, break dancing that way, but nobody, no one learns to do a complicated motion by taking the individual parts and connecting them. There's no way when you look at what this stuff looks like under, under slow motion video. And you see like these motions, like even my own playing, I'm like, how did I, if you ask me to try to get that close to the string, but not actually hit it, there'd be no way I could do that slow. Yep. Like playing, you know, some of these patterns where, um, you know, the pick has to go over the top of the string, but not hit that string because I don't want to make a wrong note. And then it's got to come down on the other side and then play with an upstroke or something. And I look at that and I'm like, how the hell did I do that? And, and not only that, but when you play the upstroke, it's got to be with this tiny little amount of pick at the very end of the pick. And I'm like, there's no way I could do that. If you, if you said, you know, to, if you told me to do this right now, slowly, it's impo- It's like practically impossible. It's like playing Operation, that kids sure. game from the 70s, yep. where yep. like you're going to touch the sides. So these things can really only be learned in that when you're in that smooth zone of just doing it, you know, and then you're going to do it sloppy a million times, but at least you're going to be doing it to some extent. You'll be like, oh yeah, it's like doing a sloppy cartwheel or something. Like you're at least tumbling over end over end. Yep. And then eventually you'll figure out that, oh, you got to twist a certain way and now it gets a little bit cleaner. Yeah. Now I got to plant my hand a certain way and it gets a little bit cleaner. It's kind of like that. You know, I, I did see uh, Michelangelo, Michelangelo Badio saying there's no point in playing it slow and speeding it up as well. Just go go fast yeah. straight away and, and find where the boundaries are and then work on that. I'm going to move on to another question here from Charles Cilia. Sure. Now, Charles Cilia is quite possibly the best luthier in Australia oh. and I – I'm going to own one of his guitars one of these days. They're bloody beautiful. But Charles uh, wants to know, well, he's, he's put it there. Troy, I find your forensic analysis of playing technique fascinating. Have you found that this focus has impacted other parts of your life in a positive or negative way? Mm, I think it's kind of like, you know, those dogs that just were not a fit for like being somebody's house pet because they were too hyperactive, but they were really good at being drug sniffing dogs at the airport. That's more like this job is now gives me an outlet for that stuff. <laughs> so it's more like I already had the obsessive focus on these kind of things. But uh, I realized it's quite a privilege to do a thing, like probably like, like woodworking where, you know, guitar building where the amount of focus and attention that that requires, you have to really love doing that. And you have, to, because you're going to be in there for hours and hours, like doing all this really painstaking detail oriented work. And if you don't like that kind of thing, man, it's going to be torture, you know? So I, I can literally look at pictures of hands all day and be completely satisfied with my job. <laughs> it's like a little creepy, but you know, I, I, clearly I have found a thing that I fit with and I'm ev- you know, ever so grateful for that. So I, I think it's the other way around. I, I think this job kind of clicked. It was a puzzle piece that sort of clicked in to all the other weird ticks that I, I may already have had and didn't know what to do with. I've got another question here from Max Solo Music. Max Solo was a fantastic YouTuber from Russia. Um, gotcha. And Max was actually helping me trying to get Max Ostro onto the show. Have you seen Max Ostro mm-hmm. play? Um, not really. I mean, I, I haven't watched him, but I, I know that he's a, a phenomenon oh, of sorts. Oh, man. He takes stunt guitar to a, a, new, a new level. Um, gotcha. But Max Solo wants to know. Now, I'm trying to just make sense of this question. Uh, Troy, what would your approach to, and then it says USX, I'm not sure if that's a typo, using uh, using a 10 to 4 wrist motion look like? Okay. Does that make uh, sense approach. to you? Uh, yeah, it does. That's a very obscure question if, if, if this is what he means. Um, the answer is Sean Lane. That's the answer. Uh, that's Sean's technique, I think. 
And he's he's asking, remember we were talking about the diagonal wrist motions that you can make yep. from like, I can go sideways, I can go straight up and down, I can go this way, I can yep. go this way. So I, I like to think of those if, if you imagine that your hand is pointing at a clock. Because they, like, how do you describe these different diagonals? It's kind of weird, right? Yep. So like, if I think about a clock that I'm looking at, then nine would be to my left and three would be to my right and 10 and 12 would be up and six would be down. So if I orient my hand again in that standardized position that we're using where your palm is facing down, and um, if we think about like side to side motion, we could talk, we could call that a nine to three motion because it's going to the two different sides of the clock, right? And this motion would be a twelve to six, would um, would be uh, you know that would be a you know the technical term for that would be wrist flexion and extension, but you can also think of it as twelve to six because I'm just going straight up towards twelve and straight down towards six. So ten to four, if I don't turn my arm or do any rotation, that would be like going up this way, and coming down this way. And I think this is uh, another kind of casual term that you can use to describe this kind of motion is dart thrower. That's when you, okay. when you throw a dart. Yep. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's kind of, it's a little bit, you know, it's not this, that's, that's dribbling a basketball. Yep. And it's not this, that's karate chop. It's a little bit karate chop, if you think about it, right? That's 10 to four. Because if you actually do this, it, you're actually going like this. It's cool, right? So this motion apparently exists um, in all kinds of everyday activities. And we interviewed these researchers here in New York that study wrist motion at the uh, hospital for special surgery. So they fix people when they break, but they also want to know what kind of activities are going to be impacted by different types of wrist um, injuries. So they, they, fag they figured out that this type of diagonal wrist motion, it feels weird to do it like this, but the dart one is super comfortable. Like you do this, it's really, it doesn't feel like a diagonal motion, but it is. Because it's, again, it's not patty, you know, it's not basketball. And it's not karate chop, which is a straight side to side. It's somewhere in between. And the wrist joint, when you do this, it's really comfortable. And you can do it really, really fast. So I think Sean Lane's picking motion was that. Because if you ever watch Sean play, he uses these two anchor points. And he just puts them on the guitar. But he plays. He, he does this. So he does all the fast. Like the two note per string. Right, so it's down up on every string. If you look at the wrist motion I'm doing here, it's that diagonal, it's the dart throwing motion. So I think that Sean Lane may have used this motion. That's my theory anyway. Other than okay. that, I don't, I don't really know. I mean, the, how, how do you do this? Well, I mean, you, you just anchor like Sean did, and then you play like fast pentatonic lines. So you're starting on a downstroke. So you play like Eric Johnson lines, but using this type of picking motion where you're almost not quite tapping, not vertical. That's 12 to 6. That's like very basketball, right? Yep. Not that, but more diagonal. It's tricky. So I, I wouldn't approach guitar technique like any of those things, to be honest. I mean, these, this is where we realize we've created this language to understand these different motions, but it leads to overthinking. Don't do that. Pick the guitar, hold the pick and go fast. And it doesn't matter. Don't think about what motion or whatever, just whatever motion, like your tremolo, which is awesome. That motion, that's ready to go. So now you just got to add vocabulary. You got to add left hand and add upstroke string changes. That's the secret with that motion. Whatever you can do fast and smooth, that's your entry point. Don't worry about what crazy thing you watched in one of our you know, videos. Our videos are like Discovery Channel videos. They're like, here's how the snail shell is built over the years. It's cool, it's for your brain, but it's not for your guitar playing. Your guitar playing is, is more of a hands-on exercise of learning to play by doing what feels easiest and going with that. And that's when a little knowledge can help. You're like, oh, I have that kind of motion. Oh, okay. So I got to use those kind of phrases. Got it. Okay, I'll work on those. You go backwards. You do what's easy first, and then back into the phrases that work with that motion, not the other way around. Cool. Now, you mentioned Eric Johnson just before. The next question that I had there, uh, let me just find my questions again. It was my own favorite cards. Yes, I am. All right, Brooke Chevelle, who mm -hmm. I believe is a fantastic country player that moved up my way ah. from Melbourne, uh, he wants to know if there is a trick for getting the sweep stroke in a descending fives to be quicker. Um, oh, you're talking descending like... Mm. That kind of thing, right? Yeah. So interestingly... Um, I think the problem most people have is not that it's quick, it's that it's too quick. Because what most people end up doing, and actually what Eric himself does, is more if you slow it down, this is what you're hearing. Okay, bit of a skip so the, in there. The, yeah, the, because the sweep is like 
going a little faster than the alternate pick notes. So you're going down, up, down, up, down, down, up, down, up, down, down. And this is why a lot of times when you hear him play, it's like some kind of weird magic act where you can't, there's like, was there a note there? Did I hear that note? You're not really sure because sometimes they get a little bit swallowed and it leads to that off kilter rhythm thing, which is part of his sound, that cascading sound where you, it's just like tumbling downstairs, like Sean Lane said, falling downstairs, right? It's like, it's not metronomic fives like I was doing. It's not that. Like there, I'm trying to be 16th. Well, Sean or uh, Eric doesn't do that. It's he plays actual fives, or he just plays complete free time, where that sweep, the sweep note, just kind of gets a little bit swallowed sometimes, and you just hear four notes really, and the, you're not even sure. Or he's like shifting, you know, he'll do. Like, and sometimes those are only four notes. Sometimes there might be a fifth note in there, but I can't tell. So um, the way that I get it to be metronomic is actually by using rest strokes. Um, it's like a gypsy thing. So I'll actually, and, and it, it all, I think becomes easier when you use this arm position because that last note, the fifth, or the, the fifth note, I'm actually laying into that and it, it stops. Like the pick actually hits the next string and stops for a fraction of a second. It doesn't feel like making two down strokes in a row though. It's fast. Sorry. So like I can do that at tempos that are fast, but there is a pause. When you film it with the camera, you can see the pick stop at that moment. Mm -hmm. So I don't know why you would want to get the sweep faster, but so I'll answer, I'm giving you two answers here. One, if you have the sweep problem where it goes too fast and it sounds like a skip or something, you can use a rest stroke or you can try to use this form, which will give you a rest stroke, which will slow it down. You do that down stroke, you'll hit the next string and it will pause for a brief moment. The other way, if you find that the whole pattern is sticky and it doesn't feel fast, if maybe that's what he's asking, like if it's like something is not smooth there, that's because there's possibly something wrong with the core motion itself. Like, can you do fast USX motion? In other words, can you do upstroke escape picking motion? Like your tremolo thing, that's the start. You need that or you won't ever be good at the Eric Johnson lines. Like if you can't do, then you'll never, right? So you have to have the fast alternate motion first. Otherwise, all that other stuff is going to feel really sticky. And um, so that's one of the reasons possibly why it might feel sticky. And um, the other one is there's, there is some trial and error element to going fast first, even if it feels weird or wrong, until you find a way where it doesn't stick. So that's the other thing that I will tell you is if you can do the single note thing, but there's something about the sweep that doesn't feel right, my best advice, even if you were sitting in front of me, would be to ask you to do it fast. Unless I see you doing something weird that looks inefficient or doing string hopping or something, which is potentially a problem. If the person is actually making two discrete downstrokes, like two down jumps, that's no good either. So we, we need to immediately not do that. So I would have to look at this, and you, you know, but you can film yourself. You can look. What is actually happening? What are you doing? But the solution is probably all the same. It's go fast and smooth first okay. until it's fast and a little bit sloppy. Now I get what USX means, so I feel a bit yeah, dumb for escape, yeah. <laughs> not getting that straight away. Uh, I thought it was a typo, but you, you referenced it there. Uh, and I'm also very um, pleased to know that Eric Johnson isn't consistent in timing on those that you said when you pulled it apart, that there's a bit of a, a yeah. stagger to the timing because I was struggling in trying to get that consistent. But to know that the master isn't yeah. consistent with that is uh, well, very... Well, he's, he's what he wants to be, I think, right? Yeah. Like, that's his vibe. He wants that kind of rhythmically unknown kind of... I mean, that's cool. That That's his thing. I don't think it's any sort of, um, like, lack of control on his part. That's just what he likes to do. Sure. And, uh, like, the, the metronomic thing really is very un-Eric-like. I mean... <laughs> that's not Eric sound really in the least. It's It's cool. I mean, and I use that technique for all sorts of lines where you can't hear the technique. Like, you're not supposed to hear that there's a sweep there when I do that. Like, I'm, I'm not trying to telegraph that. i just playing a line. And I would do that if it was a scale or any other kind of phrase. I don't want the sweep to sound different than the alternate notes, because I, in, unless I do, <laughs> you know? Yeah. But in that case, I don't, whereas Eric clearly does. Cool. I got another question here from Charles, which is a very good question. Have you looked into how fingerboard slash bridge radius affects your picking technique? 
Uh, yeah, a little bit. I mean, I think flatter is easier, basically, because yep. you're not having to constantly rejudge. Like, you know, if I'm down here and I want to do a downstroke that goes over the top of the A string, I got to go more. Like, I have to have to be higher, or I might hit. Of course, sometimes you do hit, and that's fine too. I mean, am I hitting the A on the way over? Maybe. Can I hear it? No. We need the camera to know. And even if, if we film that and we see that I'm hitting the string, it's kind of like the tree that falls in the forest. I mean, if I f literally can't tell, if I can't hear it, can't feel it, the rhythm is even, the tone is good, the line sounds good, then I really don't care at that point. Like, if, if it is good, if it sounds good, it is good, right? The problem is if you think it sounds good, but someone else can hear it. If they're like, oh, dude, it's totally, you hear that wrong note in there. Well, that's, a, that's an awareness problem, and there's a lot of that. It's like the guy who turns up the gain to 11 and thinks they sound awesome, but they don't sound awesome. And you know they don't sound awesome, but they don't know they don't sound awesome. That's a problem. That yeah. is so common. That is so, yeah. so many guys play with way too much gain. It, it's amazing. I, I was actually at a friend's place last night. We watched some Alice in Chains live, and I, I remember just nudging him and going, can you hear how, hear how little gain that – Jerry right. is actually using in his rhythm playing, man. They're like most guys would just be mm -hmm. cranking that. It's like he's got just enough going on there. Yeah, the early Ingve tone was like a lowish gain sound. Also, it was yep. was like a I forget who it was like a DoD distortion. I don't know who's the distortion pedal. I want to say it was a DoD distortion pedal, lightly like a tube screamer type sound into the old Marshall. And you, you could hear like the pick attack and stuff. That's what made it cool. Um, there was plenty of gain there. I mean, he could get whatever harmonic you know, he wanted it. It wasn't like this kind of saturated thing, but regardless of what tone you like though, the problem is like a lot of people fool themselves that their technique is better than it is. And even, you know, I'll listen back to stuff that I played where I'll hear the mistakes that I didn't hear when I played it. So it, there is, it is a challenge. The awareness aspect is a challenge. So it can be helpful to put some time in between, like when you play a thing versus when you listen to it. So then you're like, oh yeah, that sometimes you'll have the opposite, you know, reaction where you'll play something and you'll think it's sound feels awkward or something but you w watch back the tape like six months later and you're like damn i'm killing it you know and there's i watched an old practice video and in the video i played some scale or something and then at, at the end of the I'm, I'm watching this i'm thinking wow that's really good and after i played the scale the older the younger me on the video goes oh that sucked <laughs> <laughs> and, I <was> like, <laughs> and i was like yeah you just can't tell right but, but being able to hear your own mistakes, knowing that they're happening is very important. And clean tone isn't always the answer because sometimes the noise level is so much lower in clean tone that you don't get certain kinds of mistakes. So you really need both. You have to play clean tone and you need to play gain. If you want to be a gain player, you have to play gain, but you also have to play clean. If you want to be a clean player, if, you, if you're a clean tone player like a country player, you don't really need to play gain because it's never going to come up. Like those errors just won't, you know, the, the back, you know, the noise is just it's not going to be a problem, you know, and certain fretting mistakes that would bother you with high gain aren't going to bother you with clean tone because you're just not scraping things and making ugly sounds. Sure. But if you're a high gain player, there's definite benefit to doing both. And it is a struggle to hear your own mistakes. I forget what this person asked. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> what, what was the question again? Uh, I've been uh, scanning through other about... questions, so I've kind of lost it myself. Yeah. Uh, but there's the next question that I was going to ask. I there's a two part question. Somebody, he posted yeah. one half and then somebody got a couple of comments in before I found the other half. So I'll have to jump between the two. I'd love if Troy could talk a little bit more about the finger motion that players like Ingve, Tak Takayoshi Omura, and Omura, yeah. Cesario Fijo use. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. why does it happen in their playing and how it helps them? What's the role of that? little thumb motion when they are playing. Right. I think, uh, yeah, they're, this person is just talking about what we were talking about with Ingve, where the, uh, the alternate picking motion is sometimes generated. And there are varying degrees of this. Those three players that were mentioned there, Takeyoshi Omura and Cesario Figlio, they're all different, slightly different versions of this. But the one unifying thing is that these motions are almost always upstroke escape motions. Even when the players play something like a three note per string scale. Like Ingve, when he does that, he's doing it with sweeping. It's this. Right, and there are moments on the first album where he does these ridiculous blazing ascending scales. And, and you hear it, it's just It sounds like a computer, you know? And I had no idea that that was being done with sweeping. I didn't even know, or what we would call economy picking now, probably. Economy, right? yeah. I didn't know that you could, you could do that. Like, but, so when you make this motion with the thumb, you can easily push through to the next higher string, 
right? So you can do that, but what you can't really easily do is go over the top of the string when you play a downstroke. So almost all these players are downstroke sweepers and upstroke alternate pickers. So that's the USX again. It's like the Gypsy f family, the Eric Johnson family, but within the family, you have these different joint motions. The Gypsies and Marty Friedman are doing this, or the Gypsies are doing this form, but they use a forearm motion. Marty Friedman uses this form, but uses a finger something with a little forearm. Ingve uses this form, like a Doug Aldrich form, but has a mix of different motions, but a lot of them have some of this happening where the thumb pushes. But when the thumb pushes, it pushes down. It goes into the strings. So it makes the downstroke sweeping possible. The problem is when players that play this way don't realize that they can't be alternate picking a three note per string scale or can't hear the sloppiness. And I'm not saying that these players do. I'm saying that we, you know, in our teaching, we see this a lot. Like players come in and they're like, they're doing the fast Ingve stuff and it's just not clear. Like you don't really hear all the notes because they're not realizing like this technique is best when you play even numbers of notes per string and when you switch strings with an upstroke. So all the Ingve formulas work here. You can play descending lines that are four notes per string, two notes per string, or you can go down and pull up, pull off, right? Because the thumb can lift out and the index finger, they work together, they lift out, but they push in, right? So you can do the ascending three note per string sweeping and Ingve is like the best ever at that. Like his ascending three note per string scale playing is like computer, when he's on with that, man, it's like computerly on. You know, it's like and it sounds so cool. And of course you got all the muting here with the, cause this arm position gives you this, right? So it's great for that. It's great for playing Ingve style stuff, which is of course why Ingve, the intuitive genius does this stuff. He, he's built an entire vocabulary around these techniques. But to me, it's really an upstroke escape type of technique. If you start being able to do downstrokes, then you start getting into more like Martin Miller territory where the finger looks like it's actually doing a semicircle okay. like this. And Ingve doesn't, he doesn't look like that. And yeah. Omura does not look like that. So I think those guys, you know, again, I, I haven't interviewed those players. So I'm, I'm just guessing here, but, but if you just rest your hand on the guitar like this in the most comfortable way that you can, you will have this arm position here and a comfortable slouch, just like Ingve, and you push with the thumb and you'll go all, right through all the strings, just like a, a downstroke sweep. So it works great for that one-way economy style that Ingve uses. And, um, and a lot of those players, you know, they do play Ingve style licks, so. You know, I have- I, I don't, More than that, I can't tell you. I have a lot of trouble. I've tried to do the, the economy picking thing and picking through to get to the next string. Um, I was right. teaching a, a kid about a year ago and I went to show him major scale and I was tried to show him to alternate pick it. And he naturally economy picked it and pushed through to the next yeah. string. And I remember looking right. at him going, that's not what I wanted you to do, but you just keep doing that because <laughs> exactly. that's something yeah. that a lot of guys would try and do that. It just doesn't come naturally to them. So you just keep doing that. <laughs> That's the best approach. I mean, the teacher needs to be smart enough to know what all these things are and whether they're working and not working, but they, you don't necessarily need to burden the student with all this hyper-technical information. Yeah. Yeah. You just need to be like, oh yeah, that's kicking ass. Keep with that, you know? Yeah. And, and if they're doing something that's a little bit wrong where they get hung up, you might know what it is. You're like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. See how you do that with your hand? You don't do that. And like, yeah. Oh, okay, cool. You yeah. know, that's really the best teaching is the informed teaching that doesn't necessarily need, need to dump all the info. You know, you know, Troy. One thing I've never seen you tap, right hand tapping. Do you tap much? I mean, like eruption type stuff. Yeah, uh, we don't. I mean, we haven't taught anything with it. I mean, I, I only know what everyone from the eighties knows. You know? Sure. So it's straight like, away, I, I noticed eruption, that you, know? you anchored your thumb. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, it's really. And, oh, sorry, this one too. That's it. Nice. Some total of my you know tapping abilities. Yeah. But so, you, you, uh, but, you naturally you know, anchored your thumb, which I tell people is is the key to uh, gaining authority over that right hand and, and where it, it hits the fretboard. Some guys don't. Some guys just poke from in the mid midair and it just oh, looks like strange. Yeah, Kirk Hammett does that. And I just think, oh. how can you do that, man? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I never thought just, about it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I will say that of all the – what's really interesting is of all the players that do that, you know, they very few do what Eddie does with the crab grip here with the two fingers. And it looks so cool. Like I, I sometimes do this only because it looks cool. Like, because it looks Grabbing so under. Awesome I've never Eddie noticed. Does he grab under? Yeah. 
Yeah, it's two fingers. You know, the classic way is with the one finger and the two fingers. And then this is what happens to the pick. And I do this. Actually, I do do this. Okay. So the pick is wedged into the uh, middle That's finger. what I was going to ask you is what you yeah. do with your pick when you tap. Yeah, it's there. Oh, well, yep. I mean, I don't really. But, <laughs> but, yeah. but if you force me to, I do this. And I don't actually... For anybody who's watching, you maybe you saw me put it here, but I don't remember putting it here. So it's here. I don't know yep. how it got here, but it, yep. it's in there. Yep. <laughs> so that's what I do. <laughs> but uh, but I don't really, yeah, I haven't worked on it like as part of a style. Sure. I thought perhaps you starting off as a piano player and you said that, you know, you, you primarily are, that perhaps you yeah. might be playing two-handed pieces, doing a, a tapping style. Um, uh, I've got a friend, Sammy Bowler, who's great at doing these pieces, just playing himself, sort of like Satriani Midnight style pieces right or that's like not something that you do a lot of something. no i've never i've never done any of that no but like uh I, I certainly wanted to do the tapping because everyone in the 80s you know i mean eddie you know i had it like a, an image in my mind before i played guitar when, when i was in that initial phase where i was like gearing up to play guitar and i was like wanting to buy a guitar i had actually kind of almost daydreamed about being able to do that and i was like man if i could do that like the the uh you know this lick in particular that, you know, the Hoffer teacher lick and the jump solo have that lick in it. And it's just such an awesome because of all the chord colors flying by. And I, I just had this image in my mind, like if I could do that, I would do that in every solo. Man, I'd write whole solos of that. <laughs> like whole lines where yeah. I just go through all cool chords and chord changes. Because it's the color of it. It's the arpeggio nature of it that's cool. And, uh, and in my daydream i had an, an image of what it would feel like to do it and i i kind of imagined the pluckiness of it you know the pull off where yep. you kind of flick a little bit yep and i when i got the guitar and i first tried to do this you know i didn't have a, any kind of gain or anything and i just this is what came out <laughs> and sure. i was like it doesn't work why doesn't <laughs> it work and i was it took me months to before i realized it was like yeah so you push like, down oh, i pull up I do my flicking off by you pulling did? up. Oh. I can see you're pushing down. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I never thought about it. Yeah. But but there's a definite pluck there, and yeah. uh, I can't turn it off at this point, even for left hand. Yeah, yep. I realize um, I, I live with a violinist slash mandolinist who never learned legato, like on like guitar legato. Yep. And she gets, she gets, yeah, she right. gets the same sound <laughs> that yeah. I got. And I realize now that we've all learned to do a, a, like a pretty aggressive... You know, it doesn't really work without that unless you're yeah. doing the all hammers you, kind. But yeah. certain kinds of, you know. The flick. Some of that, yeah. yeah. You really have to learn that. And I can't turn that off. Um, I actually just and, saw a thing uh, of Rick amazing. Graham. Rick Graham yeah. uh, posted that he was trying to work on the opposite of not flicking anymore and just going up and down for yeah. some reason. Right. Yeah, the all hammers. Like people, there's like a bit of an, a religious war about that. Yeah, about, yeah. Some people say that it doesn't exist. Like there's always a little flick. I don't know. Yeah. I don't have a dog in that fight, but I will say that this is a different sound. Because it pulls it a little sharp and it sounds cool. Yep. At least if you like that kind of thing. But I realize that that is, like for players that didn't grow up with this, it's hard. Like I, I've tried to teach her how to do that. And unless she's really motivated to learn guitar licks, She's not going to learn that. Like that's, you got to feel that. And of course, violinists do have a technique. They call it left hand pizzicato. Yep. And they actually have a deliberate plucking where they will do insane like Paganini, you know, where the left hand plays the whole instrument. But they don't really do it in the context of, you know, like the way that we do it without the super exaggerated pluck feel. Like we just try to get it smooth. And I never, I've never thought about any of this stuff. So like the fretting stuff is, you know, thankfully most of us learn that. Yeah, you know, most people learn that. So I must admit that I was a chronic tapper for many years because my picking just couldn't keep up with what I wanted to do. Uh, yeah, and so I guess I tapped a lot when I needed to get to that next level of speed. But yeah. um, thanks to the cracking the code series, I upped my level, um, and I probably don't tap as much anymore because of that. <laughs> Well, I mean, it, it, necessity is the mother of invention, right? As they say. I mean, Absolutely. so uh, these things are all just colors in the toolbox. Yep. I mean, there's amazing things that you would have. I mean, that, that's sort of the high gothic of Eddie Van Halen is the tapping stuff that I never even knew like was tapping, like the intro to a song called Mean Street, which is maybe the coolest thing he's Dude, ever done. I've know? just played at, at the start of the year at a Van Halen tribute show that did the rounds yeah. around Australia and they had guests at every capital. And I was a guest at the Brisbane show. And I had to pick two songs, and one of the songs I picked was Mean Streets. And hmm. I learned the intro, 
And I got up you there. Did the yeah, yeah. Fuck, that's hard. <laughs> that it's is hard. So, but it's so like if I close my eyes and imagine what amazing guitar playing sounds like, irrespective of technique, that's what I imagine. Or at least high gain, you know. Because it's it's just swirling awesomeness of sound and, and the the weird meter of it also is cool. Yeah. It's not even obvious to me what time it's in. And that's even better. Like that's it's not, and it's not proggy either. It's not like, ooh, seven, eight, you know, it's not trying to impress you with its off kilter meter. It's just yep. throwing these swirling sounds at it you. It is. It's lost in that. Because every second bar is offset by, by half yeah. a beat. And that just gives it a really strange feel to listen and play. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to do that it's thing where I'm going to ask you a question and just whiz off to the bathroom. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Caleb okay. Thomas wants to know, and Curious folks, if you've got any more questions, Now's the time to to throw them in uh, before I round things up yeah. with Troy. Um, Caleb Thomas wants to know, when you're working on a lick and your brain just stops during a specific part when playing, uh, right. is that a motor learning thing or a more traditional practice thing to fix? I don't know what, what that means. Maybe he can type some clarification, but what yeah. do you mean brain just stops? Because I don't, I don't know what that means. There's a lot of – I will say that sort of on a related note, sometimes the language – is a key to like it, it gives you a hint that maybe we haven't fully thought out what we mean i mean in this case he, he may know exactly what he's talking about but like one thing we the phrase i hear all the time that i think at this point i'm gonna just attach a little bell sound to is yep. when anybody on our forum ever says oh i was working on this but it all falls apart and they say all the time it all falls apart when i go too fast it all falls apart and I'm, i've learned now that this is a very suspicious phrase because when people say it all falls apart to me sometimes i look at the video and i'm like oh yeah now it's starting to work like, oh, you were doing the technique wrong, but now you switch to the right technique, but it's sloppier, but it's the right motion. So a lot of times this falling apart is not what you think it is. Like you think the falling apart is you, something is, because you've been brainwashed to thinking that if the notes aren't right, then the technique is not right. But that's not, there's no connection there at all, really. The technique could be, it's just a motion with your hand. And whether or not that motion is the accurate motion or not has nothing to do with whether you're playing the right notes with your left hand or even whether you're picking the right string. Because... Again, you know, we're trying, to, we're trying to go for correctness of motion first. And we don't need the notes to be super correct. It's very easy to play the wrong notes with the, the right notes with the wrong motion. And it's very easy it, it, and even desirable sometimes to play the wrong notes but with the right motion because that right motion can be cleaned. But the wrong motion, once you do that a few hundred times, that's it. It's like practically permanent at that point. So falls apart is a very suspicious phrase for me. And I re recommend that if you ever catch yourself saying it, that you immediately interrogate what you mean by that and ask yourself whether anything is really falling apart or not. And maybe it, you'd be really helped to look at what is going on because you may see that you're actually doing more things right there than you thought. So I don't know what the, the freeze part is with the- Sure. So Caleb, Caleb uh, actually added to that. Uh, he says, what happens yeah. to me uh, is when I'm playing fast, I find that, I find that quite- seems like my brain can't keep up with what I'm playing and doesn't get to the next note or series of notes in time. So Sorry what physically happens phrasing. though? Yeah. So like, do, 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 do you stop playing at that point? Is that what happens? Like you just stop moving entirely? Cause that, that sounds like a memorization issue really. Because I think a lot of this stuff, you know, and the reason why guitar players use, they play licks or, or let's say phrases become licks is because they become memorized. And when they become memorized, they become automatic. So you can't really ever stop that process. It's going to happen. It's like your spoken language is the same way. I'm, I can express myself, but I'm doing it with pre-memorized little nuggets. You know. So the only solution is to go full on and just build more pre-memorized nuggets, not in the like memorization of licks, like literally trying to memorize licks, but learning such a wide variety of movable parts that you can then connect them all together into a million and one different combinations, never running out of ideas. You know, great improvisers, when you listen to them, it's not that they never run out of ideas. It's, it's, it's not that they're always being original. It's just they have so many different ideas that they mm -hmm. can draw from. Eventually, they'll start repeating or they'll start playing the same phrase, but like with a slightly different rhythm or with something else different before it and after it. But it's really how deep is your bench? You know, how much stuff, how much memory palace have you built on the fretboard? Like if I say I'm here, well, okay, what, what licks do you know? What, what things do you know on this string? What do you know up here? What connects to that? How many lines do you know that start on this chord and go to this chord, you know, here? So it's like, that's where the time, it takes so much time, you know, and that's the work I really haven't done as much of where it's like building out the improvisational vocabulary so you can connect all this stuff on the fly. 
So if the freezing is happening, it could be that there's just a lack of memorization there or something. I'm not really sure. I mean, again, I, this is the thing I'd look at. I always look at stuff. I'm like, show me the video. Show me when it happens. If you literally freeze and stop moving and can't continue playing, I'm not exactly sure what would cause that. But it sounds like maybe if it's a creative issue, like I don't know what to play next, well, then that, that's maybe just not having a deep enough bench. You need to memorize more. You need to learn more material. Sure. And that's not, you know, it's, it's not so, um, it's not necessarily like writing down 100 licks and learning them all. It's just continually over and over again playing through certain chord changes and trying to connect all these phrases together. And eventually you build up kind of like a half baked cake of a million spare parts that you can interchange at all, at all times. But I suspect, and you know, great improvisers already know this, but uh, as to why you would freeze though, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I hope that answers your question there, Caleb. Um, <laughs> now I have a question for you, Troy. Uh, with all this focus on us talking about the picking hand. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about your left hand for a second, uh, and yeah. in particular, fretboard navigation. Um, and I, I'm very fascinated with this because for years, you know, hey, we're playing in A minor, I'm going to play at the fifth fret, my little box pentatonic shape, and I milked the shit yeah. out of that for years until right. I was like, I need to learn the whole fretboard. And I started asking friends uh, how they viewed the fretboard, and it, I've come to realize that everyone's different. Do you have a particular set of signposts on the fretboard? Do, do you arrange everything at three note per string scales, cage system? What's your way of viewing the well, fretboard? I don't think three notes on a string or caged are really the, they're not sort of antagonists. Cause I mean, look, what's a cage scale? There's three notes on a bunch of those strings. Well, I don't have to play all the three notes, right? I mean, I can play lines that don't use every note on a string, in which case I've then played two. Right? Even a three note per string player doesn't always, like isn't always playing all three notes on every string. Sometimes they might. So even if you know a three note per string shape, it doesn't mean you're always playing three notes on a string. I think that's like a weird internet like argument thing where people have lost sight of what the actual common sense part of it is. There's no such thing as like three notes per string versus caged. Caged fingerings can often contain three notes on a string. The concept of cage is just that you have a chord shape with stuff near it, and that's how you organize your memory palace. And I think this is universal. I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to suggest that no matter what you think you do, I think you do that. I think the fretboard is learned like a memory palace by having shapes that you know that are in a sequence where there's shapes to the left of them and shapes to the right of them. And cage is literally the name of the sequence of shapes. Right, yep. it's C chord, A chord, G chord, you know, G chord, E chord, D chord. It's just describing the sequence as you go from the headstock to the bridge. Everything, every great improviser that I've interviewed, I've asked variations of this question to. And eventually, you know, it's hard to ask the question without asking leading questions, like, do you, you memorize shapes? But sometimes, you know, you just you have to be like, well, what do you see there? You know, Oz, yep. like Oz Noy, right? An amazing improviser. What do you see there, Oz? Uh, I see the shapes. Ah, okay. Well, what shapes? Uh, this one and then this one. You know. And it's like, oh, okay, I get it. Why? Yeah. Because I can tell you to move that chord up here and all those diminished lines you were just playing also all moved up here. They're yep. clearly connected. Yep. So everybody, I don't think there's an argument about caged. Even if, to me, caged, by the way, just means the fretboard flows in a sequence where the shapes here always flow into these shapes and these shapes and these shapes. It doesn't mean you always have to use those exact fingerings. That's moronic. I think if people think that, they're really way missing the forest through the trees. Yeah. That's yeah. way missing the point. So I think all great improvisers do some sort of co-location of shapes that connect. Because any guitar player on earth, if I say play that chord in A, now play it in A flat, that song, they do this. But you know who can't do that? Violinists. They can't do that. And I know they can only go that way because oh, really? they, don't, they don't slide shapes. Yeah, they can't slide shapes. They don't do it. The wow. only way, like if you tell a violinist to play the same arpeggio in A, yeah. and now played in A flat, they're going to do this. They might do, now they're going to go, but now that finger, maybe they can reach, but maybe they can't. So now they go here. And now do it in B, okay. Whatever, right? It, they're working it through the position until they go so far that they run out of position, then they go to the next position. That's how violin works because they have no frets. So it becomes very clear the reason the guitar players do what they do 
And by the way, I'm saying this, I've talked about, I live with violinists, I've talked to them, this idea like of just sliding a thing up a half step because the key is wrong, alien, completely alien. Wow. Like they have seven positions and that's it. And you're either in one, then you go in two, then you go in three. And sometimes you go from one to two, like in the middle, like you, whatever the piece requires, sometimes you have to shift up to two. And the positions are bigger too, because the tuning is in fifths and the frets are tiny, where the note, the distances are tiny. Yep. So they got way more, a four note per string scale is super, a stretch is super common in violin and mandolin also. So you don't really get why guitar does what it does until you talk to a violinist. When a classical guitar player says, you know, um, third position or fourth position, fifth position, those aren't positions. That's guitar fingerings. Positions on a violin is a zone like basketball, like zone defense. You don't leave this zone, that's first position that's second position, that's third position, and so on, right, all the way up. And it's brilliant. It's a beautiful system, but it's designed for rapid sight reading. The okay. reason you can't really rapidly sight read on, because any note that you see on the staff, if I'm in first position, I don't think. If you say A, it's here. Yep. I don't even look. I know that's A. I don't know. If you ask, here's another cool fact. If you ask a violinist, you point to this part of the fingerboard, say, what note is that? They don't know. Really? Guitar, yeah, they don't because it's a touch thing. They, you point to the note on the staff and you say, play that note. They go, boom, right to that spot. How do they find that spot? Touch. It's all touch distances. Like my thumb is touching here. First position, you have this part of the hand touches the neck down here. Yep. And so all the location of the notes is done by distance from that touch point. And like third position, I think, is where you start to touch the body. So this part of the palm becomes the, the reference point. And so you say, okay, where's that G in third position? Well, they touch the body and then they go right here. They don't look at the fingerboard because it's all the way the hell over here. Yeah, yeah. So they can't even see it while sight reading. So the violin sight reading system is designed, or violin position system is designed for rapid translation of staff notation to a neck. So it really, you realize now that when you say, do you know the fretboard? Well, what do you mean? Do you mean, can I point to a note and tell you the name of it? Well, that's not useful. Not useful to a violinist, so that's why they can't do it. It's not relevant to them. There's yeah, not right. even a fret to point to. So when you say, do you know the fretboard? Well, to a jazz improviser, what that means is, do you know the shapes and how they connect and all the licks in the shapes? And can you play the shapes that flow into the other shapes when the chord changes? Can you change the map when the chord changes? That's what knowing the fretboard means. It doesn't mean knowing that that's an E, you know, whatever. <laughs> whatever note is an E. It's not relevant. It's not what they need to know. Um, and it doesn't know like knowing the name of the note. It's like knowing the name of the note is different than knowing its physical position by, by space, right? So it's a very interesting subject, but, but guitar, classical guitar positions are not the same as violin positions. They don't, you can't sight read classical guitar like a violinist can. You know, they, you will be amazed at what a classical violinist can sight read. Like the most complicated, crazy shit, like, just looking at it and not even looking at the hand and with the most minimal amount of notation with just a fingering number here and there th that's how they indicate the position changes they're all default choices unless the fingering says otherwise so yeah. if that g is now a three instead of a one that means well if the g is a one instead of a three that means instead of this position i got to be up here because if it's a one that means all my other fingers have to be here so i have to shift so that's like saying shift from first to third and it's completely understood they know immediately when they see that one or a zero, like an open string or something, yep. they know immediately, oh, that means shift. And you only need that a few different times in a piece because all the other choices are default. They, were, they are what you would expect. Sure. So there will be whole bars of no notation at all because yep. that means it's what you think that, you know, use the positions you would think. That's unless fascinating. the fingering number is there. It's such yeah. a, a different approach to us guitar players. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I've got one more question here, which I think is a ripper. And that is from John. How does Ingve play his pedal tone, uh, pedal note licks? Does he use right. double escape picking motion only for that specific situation? And how does yes. he generate it? Yeah, that's how he does it. So, um, I mean, we don't have really good footage of it. And on his instructional video, he wears long sleeves, so you can't really see what's going on. But from live footage, it looks like there's like a little bit of forearm, basically. So I, it's like, and I don't do his motion, but it. Something like that, right? Now I'm being very kind of like like a little bit 
um, awkward and kind of very arm oriented. But in Ingve's case, it's always a mishmash of all these different joints. So it's like there's a little arm, but then there's some finger and maybe some wrist. On the REH video, it looks more like wrist motion. It looks more. And that's more like the Demiola Andy Wood thing we were talking about before, where you make the different directions of wrist motion. But I don't think Ingve is ever really like a Demiola or Paul Gilbert style wrist player. I think there's always a little bit of this happening and a little bit of this finger stuff. So I think the real answer to the question is I don't I don't think it matters too much what Ingve does because you just can you only have really a, a smaller number of choices. You have whatever motions you can do fast. Those are the motions you should be using, and you shouldn't really need to worry about like what Ingve does or doesn't do. If um, if you don't have any way at all that can do this, then you're going to need to find one. You're going to need to go fast with different joint motions until you find something that kind of sort of works. That's the actual algorithm for this. And um, if your technique is very similar to Ingve's, well, then maybe going fast with some motions that look like his would actually be a good idea. But only if your technique already looks like his. If it doesn't already look like his, then I wouldn't bother at all with what Ingve does. And I would just use whatever technique is the closest to whatever one you know right now. Sure. These are all a stone's throw away. They're yeah. all like a neighborhood. You could go from one side of the city to the other. And you start in the wrist neighborhood and you go, keep going, oh, look, a little more forearm. Oh, yeah, look, and now we're all the way into forearm and it's all arm and there's no wrist. Like you can think of it, you know, like a matrix, basically. You just go through it. But whatever your fast motion is now, that's the one you should be using. Cool. Hey, Troy, is there a particular guest that you would love to have on and analyze up close that you haven't had the chance to uh, to have in? We have a spreadsheet of like 300 or something names of like people <laughs> that would present something of interest, you know, which is basically everyone. I mean, honestly, everyone. If you told me I could have footage of every single guitar player ever in a giant database and I could just look them all up and see what they're doing and then I could put them all into the family tree and understand everything, I would gladly take that. Like, I want to know all the answers. Yep. So in that respect, yeah, I mean, there's so many, so many players. I mean, every kind of technique, even things like these finger techniques, which we haven't, you know, we've filmed some players that do that, like Martin Miller has a finger thing. And he's kind of, I think, similar to Kiko Lurero. Their techniques look similar. So, you know, you, you, but if you had everyone, you probably might be fine 100 people like that. You know, and you'd be like, oh, okay, I get it. That's the finger neighborhood. But not only finger motion, but that specific kind that he does where it looks like a semicircle and he does this kind of motion. So I want them, I want to know all the answers. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I don't know, it's, it's too hard to pick anyone in particular. Uh, there are certainly areas I think that we've done an okay job, you know, of like look gypsy technique because we met with Yosho and Yosho Stefan is an incredible gypsy jazz player and his technique looks pretty typical for that style, but we could stand to, to meet a few more gypsy players for sure. And um, bluegrass, I think we have an okay handle on, but I, I would certainly, um, you know, there's there's definitely more territory there because those techniques are complicated and there's also different, lots of different ways uh, to do that. So, um, you know, there's some really great players that uh, in, in all of these styles that I would gladly meet with. I, I don't know. You want me to say a name? Like, I don't know. I mean, so many. <laughs> yeah, everyone. yeah. No, I <laughs> totally get it. I, I get it because I'm the same with reaching out to people yeah. to, to come on, on this show. Uh, yeah, I know, oh, I know. And you know, here's another answer. Like the people I can't have because they're not here anymore. Like they're not with us anymore. Like Eddie and Sean Lane and Tal Farlow and Joe Pass. So many great players um, that I can't, that we, no one can meet with. And mm. those, you know, I don't, I mean, it's, you know, it, it, it's sad in a way. So I think um, th in a lot, like a lot of the stuff that we're doing, I, I hope that we're creating some kind of document for the future that will, will mean something. Because, uh, you know, not everyone will be around forever. Absolutely. I've had a couple of people mention Zach Wilde's uh, picking technique. Yeah. And Brooke Chevelle just asked again, can Troy talk a bit about Zach Wilde's technique? Is there anything we should know about what Zach does? Um, yeah, Zach is a USX player. He's another one of them. He does some kind of mystery motion. There's a whole lesson on this. I don't know if this individual is on our platform at all, but there, there's cool. an entire like eight-minute eight minute video yep. on what Zach maybe does or doesn't do. Awesome. That, uh, that I've, it's a lesson that I've, I've filmed, but I've talked about this before and it's basically he, he looks like he's using some kind of elbow joint motion, but the elbow can't technically do USX, I don't think. So I suspect, because in other words, if you move your elbow, the, the hand goes away from the guitar, right? If you just sit like this, so that would be a downstroke that goes away, not an upstroke. You can't, if you do this, that's rotator cuff. So like if I turn, if I try to pull an upstroke that goes up, 
that the elbow is working, but it but the arm is also turning. So um, I think there is a weird continuum there. I think there is an, a type of elbow motion that actually uses rotator cuff. And um, there's a great mandolin player uh, that um, Evan Marshall is a great, fantastic mandolin player who appears to have like the mandolin version of Zach Wilde's technique. And you can sort of see the arm turning like when he does this. And he's a, he does you know these upstroke escape lines. So I think that Zach's motion, although it appears to sometimes use the elbow joint, I don't think that's the only joint that's actually happening. I think it's it's definitely a USX motion because he's all about those you know Eric Johnson pentatonic patterns. Yeah, it's all even numbers of notes per string, and um, and so I I don't know exactly which joints are generating it, but I'm almost I'm certain that it's a USX motion, and it's very obvious that there's an elbow component to it sometimes, but then. It could be rotator cuff or it could be maybe even a little forearm at times. I don't really know. Cool. I wanted yeah. to ask you just quickly, um, what are you playing through right now? What what, what are you oh, using, right like a direct unit? It's or? A, no, that's the Cornford back there. The oh, Hellcat. Cornford back there. It's the only nice. amp that I really have. I mean, actually, I've had, I have like a, you know, we have a vintage JCM 800 there, which um, when Osnoy came, he played through that. But this is, you know, the, like the, the amp that I, I went to the store back like 10 15 years ago and just tried every amp in, in the entire rehearsal studio that uh, here in New York, this place called ultrasound. I think they still exist. And they had, that was like the place you went to demo all these boutique amps and they had like matchless and Dietzel and Bogner and stuff. And this was the one that did all the things that I like where, you know, you have the thing, the thing that it does is it's, it's kind of got like metal amp characteristics where the bass is tight. You don't need like a tomb screamer or something. It's not, fuzz pedal sound like I'm it it does that and of course you know it's got you know, I mean just shitloads of harmonic but it's not so over gained like a you know where you start to get side effects of too much gain like these are th it only has this much gain honestly because these are bucker level output pickups these look like single coils but these are like uh these are Zex coils, which is um, a six coil design that fits in the slot of a single coil, and it's really, really low noise. So I got them just because they fit in the um, in the old, you know, the, the single coil slots. But with any sort of like humbucker level output, and I mean like more than a PAF, right? So like a modern humbucker level of output, not even crazy, into this amp will get you enough gain to do the kind of stuff that I just played and get plenty of harmonic response out of it. But you don't start to get um, like the bass does not, it's not like rectifier fizzy where people use tube screamers and all that kind of stuff. And the notes themselves, the single notes don't get really clippy sounding. Like I noticed the Dietzel VH4 was one of the amps that I played. And on the four, like once you get to channel three or four there, like you can hear clipping on the notes, like, like a clicking noise, almost like, yeah, right. Like, and I think it's just because the notes are getting so hard clipped at that point. There's just so much gain that it no, the pick attack no longer sounds smooth. So the thing that I'm really picky about when it comes to gainy amps is just that it behaves. Like, I don't really care what the tone is per se, like where the mids are or whatever. I just don't want the bass to sound fuzz pedally. I don't want the notes to have, the, the single notes to have clipping. And I don't want there to be massive amounts of fizz, like a rectifier level of fizz. Like the first time I played a rectifier, I couldn't believe, this was after years of owning this amp and I, I went to a rehearsal studio and you hit a note and it literally sounded like static on, you hit a chord. Yeah, like, yep. It I sounded totally like get static that. on a t TV. Yep. Yeah, you know, I'm and, not then, a fan. and it's an older just it's an older design. I mean, I get it. It was a revolutionary for its time, and because uh, nothing had that level of gain at, at the time, and people had to go in there and mod that to not have so much fizz in the high end, or people would just like low pass the entire guitar track, which you never, I don't ever have to do. I put no EQ on this ever. I just, you know, I'm not in a, you know recording a dense rock mixes. I'm just doing instructional stuff, but I don't need to do anything with this. It's record ready. You know exactly the way that it is. So. And are you mic'd up, or are you running a through a through a load box and speaker simulators? Uh, no load box. It's just a DI tap. So right in between the head and the cabinet, there's a. I got like a. I don't even know what unit it is. It's like a twenty dollar DI that can accept a. Uh, you just you know head output in, speaker output out going into your thing, and then there's you know you can plug your mic cable right into that and get a minus forty dB tap. Wow. Right off wow. And then are so you adding speaker just, simulation afterwards or does that box? Yeah, have it's, an, it's an impulse of, no, it's an impulse in logic of this exact cabinet. So nice. I, I just, 
did the IR of the Cornford cabinet. So it sounds like, obviously I'm, I'm in a different room now where I made the IR in our old studio. But at that time, on that day, with that 57, which is all, that's what you're hearing. This is a, that's a 57, nothing nice. fancy. That day, it was indistinguishable. You could A, B, the mic track, and this. But if you move the mic a half an inch, now it's different. Or even you try to put it back in the same spot, it's a, it's a little different. So it's not the fault of the IR. The IR is dead, dead on. It sounds exactly like this thing mic'd up. IRs are a great technology, man. I, I, it's game changing. Yeah, some of the, the boxes I have here, load boxes, uh, and then either use that box to add the IR or add them afterwards. Um, yeah. You know, talking to Steve Stevens about a year ago, and he brought up, uh, before we went live, I said to him, oh, man, I just saw your concert uh, at, at Brisbane um, not that long ago and your tone. And he said, oh, yeah, we, we've started using load boxes and IRs. And he said, I'll never yeah. go back to miking. He, he went oh, out yeah. the front. His his sound guy said, come and listen to this. And he just said, I've never heard right. my guitar sound so fucking great. And he was always going to use that. Uh, I mean, I, I don't hear any difference at all. That's the thing. It's exactly the same. That's the whole point for an IR to me. It sounds exactly like the mic. It doesn't mm. sound better than the mic. But yeah. it might be easier if there's no bleed from the drums or something like yeah. that. Like that, yeah. I can understand. But, you yeah. know, what would be, if you've ever listened to any of those, like, isolated guitar tracks from Van Halen 1, you can hear Alex you know, ba banging away on the drums through the guitar mic, and it's the coolest thing ever. So this is what you lose, you know. Yeah. If you don't have a, a mic right up on the grill, yeah. you don't, you're not going to get, you're going to hear Dave screaming in the back. Or some of that might be, you know, crosstalk from the, the tape or something. But, but yeah, I don't, I don't think it sounds better at all. I think it sounds exactly like my amp mic'd up. So that's, that's kind of why I do it. There's Without really those issues of, oh, I just kicked the mic over and all of a sudden my sound isn't the same. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. For awesome. sure, yeah, absolutely. And I have like three different IRs of the same thing from different days. They're all slightly different, but basically more or less interchangeable. So, yeah, I just do it so that there's, um, when we do interviews, if they play through this amp, I can get completely quiet. Because here we don't, it's not loud. This amp isn't very loud right now. I mean, it's louder than me talking. It's like I like a little loudness in the room, but it's yep. not deafening. It's not like yep. Marshall loud. Yep. But if somebody comes in here for an interview and they're talking while they're playing, now I have a completely silent guitar track that I can use for the musical examples where they play the arpeggio and they're not talking halfway through the, you know, the arpeggio. So that's why we do the DI, really. That's the main reason. But there's no cool. load box. It's just, it's just a DI. Oh, nice. I have to check out something like that. Troy, would you believe we're pushing three hours already, mate? I'm going to round things up. I told you that was off limits. <laughs> I, I told you it's a, it's a time warp. Yeah, and it yeah, yeah. Goes in no time. Troy, thank yeah, you so yeah, much for your time, man. very mad at me. Uh, no, uh, no problem. I really uh, for having uh, really enjoyed talk talking to you, mate, uh, and and learning a little insight about you. Uh, I just want to remind people out there that have been watching, if you got as much out of this as I did, please like, subscribe, all that kind of thing. Remember, you can yep. get the audio only versions on all your favorite podcast sites. Um, and I thank you guys for your questions, and most importantly, to Troy for his time. How about we all give right Troy on. a round of applause? <laughs> Yay! <laughs> see man who doesn't play live you probably like the sound of that applause i uh, it's just it's disturbing so <laughs> don't do it actually when i did it to scott henderson he said there was a female in there cheering we don't get females at our gigs <laughs> yeah exactly right yeah <laughs> awesome troy i'm gonna hit my magic button yeah. that ends it all and brings up the end screen and bid everybody a goodbye and a thank you to you cheers right on